You're listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. And away and around we go. We are back live. Welcome back, Leatherhead Nation, to the Getting mm. Salty Experience Podcast, the only one in the world that brings the firehouse kitchen table right to you, self-proclaimed best firefighter <laughs> I would say first responder podcast in Ooh. the whole wide world. Yep, I'm going there. Yep. I'm going to say self-proclaimed greatest podcast to ever grace the airwaves. Well, that's, uh, that's great. I don't that's, know. Joe, Joe Rogan that, might have something to say about that. Whatever. But. I It's self-proclaimed. I can <laughs> say whatever I want. Trademark Ricky Bobby Inc. Oh, you could say whatever you want if it's self-proclaimed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to self-proclaim I like Ruffy's sweatshirt tonight. I got the same one, V-neck, right? Back it's in the, the day. Old one. Yeah, that was a back in the day one, yeah. Yeah. Petey, up, Petey could probably use, uh, you know, I saw his little post today. It Freezing. Brick, it was a little brick out or something. Oh, I was wearing, a little chilly. I was wearing shorts and a T-shirt. I was going to say, it's 50 degrees out. Damn what, what, what this are you gonna weather do to out? hell. Damn what are you gonna this do weather. 10? Damn this weather straight to hell. Man up. Okay? Wow. No. Oh, oh, you said it. I I was thinking it, but you said no. it. Thank you. Welcome back. Welcome. We're back. Two in a row now. And then back you're off. Back. And then and you're we're, off. We're attacking Pete. This is my favorite more. This is my favorite <laughs> part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what do you got in there? A little coconut water? No. <laughs> yeah, no? last week it was coconut water. What do you I got? Know, this I've, week he's I've, chili. Uh, Sugar-free sugar vitamin water tonight. Uh, oh, he's got a roly-poly cola in his little thing <laughs> over there. What do you used to say, Kev, all the part? P U double S Y boy, right? That was like the big ah, guy. yeah, a little P U double S Y. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now it's you don't want to drink, you know. I'm before, to see, uh, yeah, remember yeah, in the middle, of, remember in the middle of the pandemic, he's I'll got pull the, this out. He's got the sky. Oh, there it is. I'll, I'll pull, yeah, I'll yeah, pull yeah. this out. I'll, yeah. pull, I'll pull this out. Don't don't make me pull this out. I'll pull, make it out. pull this out. I'll, I'll pull this out and show it to you, and then I'll put it back. I Thing swear is, to God, I will. I only, I swear to goodness, I only drink top shelf, bro. You know how I roll. That's yeah. I swear to God, I'll pull this out. Going to see yeah. Doc Brown tomorrow. Yeah? Oh. Yeah. From, uh, Back to the Future? Everything all right? Dr. Do Dr. Emmett Brown? Dr. 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 Brown. <laughs> oh, no, Rob Brown. Rob you know, Brown. Yeah. Who'd you think mm -hmm. I was talking about? The guy from Back to the Future, Emmett everything, Brown. Uh, oh. Everything okay? Are we nervous? Or is it just a Marty! Shot? What's going on? What's going well, on? Well, I'll be nervous when he puts a rubber glove on and says, don't worry, this uh, won't hurt a second. Uh, yeah, 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 be able, no, I don't know. No, just glove he says, Louis, say 1.21 gigawatts. Woo! <laughs> 1.21 gigawatts! I'm sure going to the local store, you could buy a piece of plutonium. But now in 1955. Ah. Yeah. Oh yeah. my god, dude! Yeah, right, so wow. what's up? We, we got a paid customer here. Why don't you throw that out there first? Oh, let the yes, guy earn his, yes. you know, he paid. Let him. Oh, we well, like these guys too. Well, listen, we love our sponsors, and uh, <clears throat> and it's no less for uh, Chief Three Hundred and Sixty. So here we go. Are your responders slowed down using outdated or unreliable technology? Chief Three Hundred and Sixty enhances operation with technology products that reduce response times and increase situational awareness. Chief 360 Station Alert is the most affordable and reliable alerting system on the market. Designed with health and cardiac wellness in mind, it uses escalating tones to alert and wake up responders. The system also uses both CAD and tone dispatching to ensure rapid, reliable alerting. Chief 360 Mobile offers an easy-to-use interface to get responders fast and accurate dispatching into the palm of their hands. When every second counts, rely on Chief 360. Check them out now at Chief360.com. Again, that is Chief360.com. That voice is velvet. That guy should be have a cigarette and bills. A, and, you know what I mean? Got to pay the bills. And a whiskey in his hand, right? You would think that guy uh, would have a whiskey in his hand. I've been a... called the songbird of my generation. Oh, are you crooner? <laughs> crooner, you. you know, first, actually, speaking first, of do song, it your old lady's coconuts. That's what we're oh, going to say. Oh, <laughs> we have some coconut old lady coconuts on you our uh, cup of Joe this week. About the way you saw those Woo, coconuts. Yeah. Uh, first, first do it, your alfalfa sprout sandwich. I just want to shout. I, I, I have one quick, quick shout out. I want to go. Give go ahead. Oh, before let me just before you this one, Chief Steve surgery's good. Oh Here yeah, go. he's back up limping around. Also, another guy last Friday 
Went to see uh, Rob Brown for his full body checkout. So good men. Ruffy, Hank's going. Guys got to do it. We're going we're gonna to do something about this. I didn't talk to you about this yet, but we're going to put something together, like maybe a nonprofit or something, so guys can go get these scans to get themselves checked out more frequently. But that's a conversation we'll have later. Nice. So, yeah, Pete, what's your shout-out? Yeah, man, I want to shout-out a, a, a rapper named Loza Alexander who has the number one song in the country, and it's entitled Let's Go, Brandon. And I, I just, love it. I just want to give him I thought you had a snippet right of there. it. No snippet? I, no, right. no, I can't. We don't, I don't want to get dinged, but I just want to oh. you know, I just want to say we're winning. We're going to win. That's all it is to it. All That's right, it. Winning. winning. You know, we got to win. We got to bring in our guest. Great guy. Big dude. Yep. Yep. Another big dude. What's with all these he's big dudes? Big dude. He's up there with uh, he's Ray Strong Big. He really yeah. is. Big. And uh, the other guy we had on, Horsehead from Rescue One. Remember Horsehead, the arm wrestler? Who? Horsehead. <laughs> His nickname was Horsehead. What are you guys, losing it? From Rescue One. That. He was the arm wrestler. Remember the arm wrestler? Yeah, the guy. Wrestler? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We had that whole uh, Stallone arm wrestling movie uh, yeah, over the top clip. Yeah. Like, <laughs> All right, let's bring in another guy. This guy comes right from the Muppets. Is, uh, was it? Uh, not the, you're not going to pull, pull up his probably picture yet? We're going to bring him in? No, we'll bring him in. Oh, I mean, I mean, we can bring him in. And, I mean, what fun is it to bust his balls if uh, oh, you're right? Not oh, listening. We're gonna bring in Neil Fern to Fern to Hern to Jurgensen. Thank God he's in Tennessee. You don't have to worry about him chasing us down. Oh, yeah, it'd be a while before he get up here and get his hands on me. Thanks for having me. And uh, Pete, I, I had my, my coconut water all set. But hey, 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 see that? I'm liking the whiskey. You got some street cred with that one. <laughs> All right, brother. Yeah, man. Was, I love it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. But uh, I love the ball breaking. It's good to be back in the kitchen, guys. It's been a long time. And, uh, you know, as, as we live now in a world of hurt feelings, it's good to be back in a place where feelings don't matter. Right? So oh, no, uh, thank they don't you, matter. Guys. I love that. I might be stealing some of Neil's uh, words wow. here. Every time we come on. Hagen, 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 Hagen. The Hern, Hern, in the world of hurt feelings. Uh, aside from being a Viking, I'm actually an Irish guy. My mom's off the boat and still has the accent. So, uh, oh, no, well, uh, well, you know, hey. Well, all right, you're Swedish. The Vikings, <laughs> the Vikings did raid Ireland. That's how you yes. guys got your red yes. hair and all that. So, yeah. And the yeah, size. A product, of, a product of incest, Pete. Thank you very much for awesome. <laughs> Not incest. So, not incest, sir. And, and Lou, it's been a while. It's been a while since I last saw you. Uh, probably about 2007. I relieved you at 103. And That's my right. my beloved CO of the ceremonial unit, Joe the Bugler Minogue, took Joe the uh, opportunity to leave his locker unlocked and leave his prized bugle <laughs> unsecured. Oh. And I took it. And I held it hostage for a little while with nice. a note that if I didn't get some large amounts of money, he'd find it in many, many pieces. I would have rubbed. I would have rubbed my junk all over it. To be yeah. honest, and not, <laughs> and not told him. his mouthpiece. I would have put his mouthpiece where it doesn't so shine. Joe, so Joe, if you're out there listening, I'm sorry. I didn't have the heart. I had to get so, it back. Is he, uh, I know, is, is he the guy that comes to the shows all the time, Joe Manoa? Yes, that is Joe. Joe, yes. Joe, Joe, Joe yeah. the I, do what you got to do is you rub your nuts on it and you never say nothing. <laughs> uh, and the next love, time he's blowing on the bugle, you're just uh, laughing. I love Joe too much. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. Uh, cool. Put him right between two pillows. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, my God. What yeah. happened to the world of hurt feelings? Come on. <laughs> it's better than taking a, It's better than taking. A, allegedly uh, taking a dump in a beaker. You know uh, what I mean? Yeah. 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 I, I took a dump in a paper plate one time and left it on a show to see who sprayed me in the mouth with a with a phone can, so I got him back. Ah, good. there you go. He'll dump on a pillow. Yeah, but the <laughs> so lieutenant of fun you can have with poopy. <laughs> yeah, the no lieutenant doubt. was a little bit upset with me though because it stunk up the cab. But uh, oh just... man, but guys, yeah. uh, just want to say thanks a lot. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I, I have some big shoes to fill. I, I, you know, I'm a fan, and I've seen some of your guests, and they're incredible, incredible uh, icons in our job and in our you know, fired upon first responder world. So I, I just want to say thanks a lot. I, I take it like I took the job at the FDMY. It's a high honor and thank you. It's my, it's my privilege to be here. So thanks it's a lot. A, it's an honor to have you brother. And, it is an and honor. You know, like, like I told you before, we're here to honor your career. So, uh, Yep. Let's get rolling, man. All right. Yeah, nice well, we already know. I was going to ask you the question, how you got a job. You told me your dad put 30 yeah. years on the jail. Yeah, business, my, dad, right? my dad, Paul, who's a wonderful, wonderful guy, Brooklyn born and bred. I uh, still have him. Thank the good Lord. He's 82. 
Um, my dad did 34 years, um, was an Air Force crash rescue fireman as a young guy. And uh, his claim to fame there was he uh, he forgot to put on his watch hat. And when President Eisenhower landed up at Stewart Air, Air Force Base and they all saluted him, he had to go into the old Air Force One and clean out the uh, the shit pot for the president as punishment. So uh, that's one of my dad's <laughs> stories. Nice. nice. We, got, we got his picture, Petey. Somewhere, I think. Oh, the probie picture? Yeah, my dad. No, 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 the picture of his dad. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The, guy about, about. the guy we're talking about. The guy we're actually talking about right this second. I know what we're talking about. I'm just prepping for other oh, things. Yeah. What happened? Okay. What happened? There's There's lots of things. That you can't. <laughs> There's my right there. That, uh, yeah, that's unfortunately the day of Kevin Kane's funeral. Um, oh, Kevin shit. was a very good friend of mine, but my dad, my dad was a cancer survivor, and and you know had been going through years and years of treatments, but. I'll never forget it. It was 96 degrees, and, and he still wanted to suit up and pay respect. So, uh, wow. He looks like a hard-charging, salty guy, man. And you know what? Salt of the Earth, and that headline is actually uh, from the day they showed the iconic picture of Ladder 118 going over the Brooklyn Bridge, knowing they weren't coming back. And really? I took, I took that headline, and I put it because that's what I, my father made. I like it. So, Pop, God bless you. He, uh, he came down with real bad cancer with, with 15 years on the job. Um, and uh, had, had really, really serious uh, chemo for four and a half years. Um, he was sent home to die. And basically his doc said, hey, you know, uh, I'd like to make you a test pilot for this new drug back in 1978. And he says, hey, doc, I'm a fireman, not a pilot. And she goes, no, no, you, this, this is a trial study. <laughs> and every, every two weeks for four and a half years, my pop would... Uh, he get he go to work. He get on a train in Staten Island at four in the morning. Um, they put him in fire prevention after his cancer, and uh, he would basically go to work. And at noon, the chief would send him home, and he'd go to the cancer treatment center, and he'd get his uh, his infusion. And within two hours, he'd be violently ill for hours. Uh, excuse me oh, for days. Man. And I just remember as ten year old wiping his mouth, cleaning the vomit, oh, um, goodness, couldn't even drink water. So that's my hero right there. And you know. People ask me, you know, what, what's the biggest problem in the country? Lack of fathers. I had a great one. I still have them. And yeah, if everyone had mine, they'd all be successful. So, wow. Pop, thank you. Thanks for the education. And uh, as he always tells me when we hang up the phone, keep low, kid. So I love How's you. Does he How's still he... say that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He says, how's, he, how's he feeling now, man? Is, is he, uh, he, is he all right now? He's good, Coops. He, thank God yeah. he is a horse, man. He's 82. He's had six heart surgeries, three cancers. Oh, shit. And, oh, my I mean, goodness. And, and I, I hate to say this, but on St. Patty's Day of 20, he went down. EMS responded to his house in Staten Island, and uh, these two guys, for some reason, couldn't see doing their job. Told him he only had to take a crap, get himself down to the doctor. Turns out he was <laughs> ruptured and bleeding to death internally. Um, ended up in the hospital for seven weeks during the height of COVID. Oh. And still come out on the other side, good on the wow. good side. I mean, that's one tough son incredible. of a bitch right there, he's man. A, that's a tough he's son a tough little truckie. And uh, I ran into a guy years ago who who worked with him. And now my dad is that old school. He says nothing. He he scores a touchdown and hands the ball to the ref in the end zone and walks out. And some old timer said to me, "My God!" He goes, "You're Jorgie's kid," because they call him Jorgie for Jorgensen. And I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Your father was the best irons man I've ever seen on a job." And I said. You're talking about my dad? Oh, kid, <laughs> we went, went down one time in, in, you know, in the upper floors of this building, and I think he forced 20 doors in like five minutes. And and, and my dad no never shit. told me that story. He, wow. he tells me nothing because he's just so humble. So yeah, Is your mom so, around? My mom, God bless her, with her Irish accent. She's uh, she's going to be 75, and she's fighting a good That's fight. She's good. got Parkinson's. Uh, still uh, her Irish accent, still calls her. Calls me twice a day to remind me I'm her little boy, and uh, you know, and uh, she's a great soul. She, um, when I was a young kid, I was getting bullied pretty bad, and I was about uh, 12, and she caught me going to uh, school with a pocket knife, and I was going to take out the guys beating me up, and she's like, "Jesus Christ, you can't do that! You'll end up in jail. I taught you better." So she, <laughs> she, she brought me home and, and, and made hold me on one second. Me. You were getting bullied. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, um, Before we had a growth spurt. Hey, well, no struggle. Help happy, the judge uh, find his checkbook, will you? Uh, uh, my father put me on a mission after that to, to defend myself. Uh, and after all the training, I had some older guy in the neighborhood, and, and he tried to start, and I got him in a headlock, and I, I could have pounded the piss out of him. But I said, all right, Frankie, you know, we, you made your point. Let's walk away like men, because my dad says it takes a man to walk away from a fight. And 
I walked away and Frankie came streaming back around and punched me five times in the face and uh, broke my nose. And, and my father's like, oh, I really only meant that symbolically. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you yeah. got them to make sure they don't move after that. That's yeah, it. so Frank, thanks a lot, Frank. I appreciate it. I really, I <laughs> you son of a that. bitch. Hey, yeah. Pete, before we get too far, we never did the, the word of the day. I don't yep, think. yep. No, we got, we got to give these uh, lushes in our mm -hmm. audience the word of the day. And that being said... Our word of the day is Swedish Shad. My grandfather Nels is rolling over in his grave. He's from Denmark, but I'll forget. Denmark, Sweden. Whatever. They're all socialists now. I don't know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but thank you guys. Wait, look, You're not you too got, good like, with geography, as you with, might. With, with, your, with, your, uh, with your proby pick here, you, there's even smoke coming out of your ears. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> but you know what? I will say this, B. When I got to 114, the legendary Marty McGovern, James Gordon Bennett winner, one of the sweetest men on the department, he says, Hey, kid, welcome to the best shop on the job. What's your name? I said, I'm Nels Jorgensen. He goes, No, you're going to be sweet. I go, but Marty, I'm from Dem from Denmark. He goes, doesn't matter. You're the Swede. So, so Marty, he told me the Swede. You don't have to be accurate. You know, Very nice. Why well, let the truth get in the way of a good story, right? I Absolutely, mean, the right. man. Right. All right, yeah. so you get on in uh, 1990. What were you doing before that? Did you get a job before that? You went right in? What were you doing? <laughs> I, uh, I've been one of those, uh, most, unlike most Americans, I've been fully employed since I'm 13 years old. Um, oh. but, uh, I, uh, I don't, you know, yeah, it's different times. But uh, I, I was uh, basically, what happened is we moved to Ireland when, my, when I was a sophomore because my dad got his 20 and he was still in a cancer limbo. My mom thought going to her home was the best way to go for a safety net. And we stayed just shy of a year. And my father's like, no, nah, no, nah, we're out of here. This is in America. And I love Ireland. I love my family there, but it's not America. So the, back then they would let you come back on the job. So he got back on after 20 and did 14 more. Wow. Um, wow. I got back into high school and I was in Monsignor Farrell. And one of my best friends is a guy, Brian Foster, who's the captain of 84 truck. And Brian and I used to sit in biology class talking about our dads being on a job and we were going to be firemen. And Brian and I went to the police academy together the fire academy together, first, the same precinct, the first precinct together. We went to the fire academy together and we went to flips together. And then I failed the captain's test and he did it so that we broke our, our, our chain. But, ah. but yeah, so I, I was good friends with him, but then I failed out of Farrell. I fell way behind. Um, I wound up in Tottenville High School getting my, you know, fighting for my life every day because uh, I was from Farrell and there was a big football rivalry. No and, um, I got out of school and, and uh, the girl I was dating at the time wanted me to be an accountant. And I went to Baruch in Manhattan. I don't know how I even made it, but I got in there and I failed out. And my father was all over me. Um, he had me take every city test. And he's like, look, you're going to F this up, man. You got to straighten it out. He goes, if, you, if you're going to live under my house and you're not going to school and you're going to join the army. So me being a wise guy, I went down at a recruiter, but I didn't have balls big enough to sign up for four years. So I signed up for the reserves, which ended up being eight years anyway on reserve duty. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I'm shipping out the base of training. And Lou gave me a flashback because back then with our medical, we had this little old German doctor. And she said, bend over. I want to see your sphincter. But she put on the <laughs> <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. She wore the same glove for 25 guys. Well, it's got to be better uh, than Doc Brown. I mean, that's yeah, got to be better yeah, than Doc bad, Brown. Though. That was bad. Uh, that, not much on the hygienics. So I shipped out the basic <laughs> training. And I call my old man up. They give you one call, you know, to let your family know that you survived the, the trip down there. And I was like, Dad, I want to come home. And he's like, ah, don't make a man out of you. See you, kid. And he hung up the phone. And, and best thing I ever did. Um got back, did heavy labor construction for a few years, waiting out the city. I uh, I walked in for the corrections job to, to swear in, and it was in the Brooklyn house. And I took one look around it, and I said to the captain, I'm sorry, sir, I, I'm not doing this. And I walked out and uh, went on to EMS, uh, went back then when chief sons didn't take all the jobs, right? You, you, you actually had to want to be on EMS. So I got on EMS. Um, and while I was finishing up the academy, NYPD called me. Um, I wound up Holy doing shit. short of two years on the police, 
And I love the I love being a cop actually. Um I was down in Alphabet City during the crack wars and it was Ooh. a very, very dangerous place to work. No. Um what oh uh, yeah, yeah. When I look at <laughs> when I look at the beating the cops are taking uh physically and symbolically, I shake my head because there's a young guy, I believe, from the rookie class before me <clears> that's <throat> still up in Kessler Institute and he's a vegetable because they dropped a bucket of cement on his head and sheared off the back of his skull. But by the grace of God, he survived and he's still alive, you know, 33 years later. I remember um, that. So it was a real experience. It was an awakening. And it was funny. I used to take my lunch. You couldn't eat anywhere down there because there was just nowhere safe to go. So I used to take my meal in 28 engine and 11 truck. And I'll never forget it. There was this old timer, John, who was in the engine, the chauffeur. And he used to call me any day now because he knew I was on a list. And one day there was a probie bitching about something, how much the job sucked. I think he was, you know, uh, the last class under the old contract and he got skunked. So, you know, we were only making 19 grand back then. And he was going on and on and on. And the guy, John, winked at me. He goes, any, any day now, you want to trade this guy? I took off my gun belt and I went to give it to him. I said, bro, I'll ride for you right now. You want to trade? And his face went white. I said, you got the best fucking job in the world and I'm going to be on it someday. So the guy, John, gave me a wink. And after it was all over, he goes, hey, kid, he goes, that was perfect. You set that fucking guy straight. And the funny thing is, about two and a half years later, I'm on a job. I'm detailed to seven truck. And we got a banging, like, second or third alarm over on 17th Street. And you seen the kid. And no, I see John. So oh, oh. <laughs> I, see the, I see the old timer chauffeur. I go, hey, John. He goes, bro, where do I know you from? And I take off my helmet. He goes, any day now, you fucking man. <laughs> and it was great. And I gave him a hug, and he's hugging me. I said, how'd the probie make out? He goes, yeah, he fucking got off probation, that piece of shit. You know, but but it was it was great. He was so happy that I got on. And, and I had already known how great the job was, obviously. But he was so excited for me that I made That's it. That's good. You know? That yeah. is so yeah. funny that he said that because you see people, right? And Guys will wave to you. You know, you know the guy's face, but you don't know where the heck yeah. you know people from yeah. over time. You know what right. I mean? Right, right. And that's what it was. I think he just, you know, for a brief second, and I guess because he would mess with me all the time, like every day he'd say, no news any day now, but hang in there, hang in there. You know, so over the course of a year, <laughs> nice. you get yeah, to yeah, know the yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. You know? I like yeah, it. Yeah, it was great. It was great. So, uh, so yeah, so story. I did my time on the PD, and uh, Brian Forster and I resigned on the same day. And the duty captain called us a disgrace for uh, leaving the NYPD. And the rest of the guys at roll call clapped yeah. for us and said, good for you guys. Good work. Yeah. And the captain was, he was humiliated. Um, got to Proby school. And I tell you what, guys, it was the, aside from, you know, the births of my children and, and some other, you know, marrying my wife and my 30 years next week. Um, I mean, it was, it was my dream. When I was five years old, I used to go to my dad. My dad was in a 172 truck. And I remember my mom occasionally would drive us down there just to say hello. And I remember walking in, it was like these giants with mustaches, right? And, and I could smell the gear and the rigs and they would interchange with 111. So they caught work every other night and then they caught their own work in Coney Island, Bensonhurst, whatever. And just the smell of, you know, you know, when we walk in quarters and you go, oh yeah. yeah. Back right. then the diesel before the Niederman. The diesel coming <laughs> off the walls, right? And, and, and just the whole fucking act. And, and then I remember walking around and all these guys are giving me ice cream and cake and don't tell your mother. And, you know, and I'm going and they're all laughing and smiling. And I'm going, oh, yeah, yeah I'm going to be like my dad. And back then he used to get detailed to 109 truck over on 3rd Avenue, and 66th Street, 67th Street. And I lived five, six houses down from the firehouse at the time. So I get on my little big wheel and I go up to the corner and my mom would be out there, you know, sitting on a beach chair. And I'd sit on the corner and I'd wait for the rig and it would take off. And I'd be running with my big wheel, beating him for about three seconds. And I'd see my old man waving at me and he'd just be laughing going down the street. Yeah, so I was hooked from, from being a kid. And uh, so when I got to Proby School, it was like my, my life's dream was fulfilled. And anything after that mm -hmm. was great. It was just the greatest, the best. Yep. Yeah, no doubt, brother. So uh, should I ask you? Should I ask you how you got to 105, or should we even ask him, roughly? No, no, oh, I, I, yeah, that's a great picture. You know, that uh, God rest him, Jimmy Young. Jimmy Young is in there, and um, Jimmy was a dear friend of mine. Um, 
and I could just about name just about every guy. My God, it's here. Where is he in this pick? That's Tommy Donnelly in the um, bottom left there, isn't it? Tommy Donnelly is there. Um, I'm trying to, I'm, you know, I don't want to mess up the, the tech here. And uh, because if I touch the screen, I know I'll lose you guys. But it looks like to me, that's Bobby Ford in the second, the top row. Bobby died of a 9-11 cancer out of 284 engine. Um, and then Jimmy is, oh gosh, I, I, Jimmy is on the second Middle. Coming from, the bottom, third, coming from the bottom, from the, bottom, from the end, coming, right? Coming from the bottom, second row, third guy over. I yeah, believe yeah, that's, that's Jimmy. what I was thinking. Gary Adorio's yeah. next to him, and uh, and I'm I'm the guy who was much skinnier and had a lot more hair on the far right end. I and um, you stick out. I, I we was, got you, man. I was the squad leader, and and you know because I was in the military, and the good and the bad of that was. You know how it is, like, you know, the, the, the instructor's going to rip you up when something goes wrong. And I'll never forget it. I, I still, to this day, love when I run into him. There's a guy, Marty Charles, from Engine 255. And we start every morning, and I try to give just a little pep talk. All right, guys, let's do our best today. Let's be squared away. And the second I started walking down toward the squad, I, all of a sudden I hear, I am Nels. You will march or I will kill you. And it was <laughs> and years later, I mean, every once in a while, I don't care if it was five years out, 10, 15, 20 years out, sometimes we pull up as like a relief company at a fourth alarm at like three in the morning. And I'd, I'd, I'd see a silhouette up in the window when I'd hear, I'm this, I will kill you. And it was, <laughs> and, and Marty, That's was, good stuff, man. It was a classic ball buster. And I tell you, we had a great, great squad. And and Kevin Kane was in the second squad, and Kevin was a buddy. <clears throat> and, and you know, being a guy who was bullied pretty bad, um, Kevin could hold his own. I mean, Kevin was an airborne ranger, and and he actually tried to become a priest at one point. And Kevin was one of those guys where if you pushed him far enough, you're gonna get dead, right? Because he's an airborne ranger. But he didn't want to unleash that. So guys sometimes would really, really push it. And I go, guys, do me a favor. Give him the respect. You don't understand. Airborne infantry training is the, is the real fucking deal. So Kevin and I became pretty tight. And, and, and I would, you know, I'd make him hang with me at lunch. And, and then, he, you know, he, he started feeling comfortable in his own shoes. And I'll never forget it because I got to 105. And, and I'll veer back in a second. As you can see, I go all over the place. But right. I got to 105. And Kevin went up to 110. Mm -hmm. Right up to so we'd run in together, and he'd bust my balls. Hey, did you cut a roof yet? Hey, did you force a door yet? Hey, did you get the OV yet? And he was just outpacing me on everything. And September 13th, 1991, I can never forget the day, KC, badge number 12143, he burned it at Denise, New York. And Bruce Stanley from 107 Truck, who I ended up working with in 80 Truck in Staten Island, um, Bruce was just retiring when I finished when I was finishing up my career, unbeknownst to me, and Bruce was the gentleman who who sent the bucket up to get Kevin as he dove out the window. And, you know, not to go sad and melancholy, but the strange irony was Kevin Kevin lived 20 hours in the burn center, and, and you know, he was one of the lead-ups to us finally getting bunker gear. But the catch was Jimmy Young and I and Kevin were very good friends in Proby School. That's so crazy, I, man. I drove Jimmy to Kevin's wake. Oh my and, goodness gracious. Yeah. And we were haunted because, because Kevin died with, we had 10 months out in the field mm. and we were haunted. And the strange irony is I ran into Jimmy. I keep in touch over the years. And the last time I saw him, he was doing a painting job in Staten Island. And I said, Jimmy, what the frig are you doing out here in God's country, bro? You know, he was a Queens boy. He never went to Staten Island. He says, ah, I'm doing a job for somebody as a favor. I'm thinking about trying to get to Brooklyn. I got a, I got a paper in. I think it was for 236 or 290. And uh, he goes, you know, my brother's Brooklyn guy, and I want to be, you know, like. So I said, yeah, no, I definitely, man. Good luck, good luck. And then all of a sudden, I think it was like three, four months later, and you know, oh poor Jimmy God. got arrested, Captain Drennan and Chris Seidenberg, you know. Yep. Yeah, Dude, that's so, crazy that you were with both of those guys like that, and then. I know. And, and John Drennan, this is the strange, Lou. You know, sometimes things connect, right? John Drennan was a legendary 114 guy, and I, I wasn't in 114 yet. And Chris Seidenberg was dating my wife's best friend. And six months before that, I was on the phone. Holy with the guy. shit. You know, 
and was busting his chops. He introduced himself when we were supposed to go out on a dinner date and whatever, and it never materialized. And I was doing the old Brooklyn bullshit. Hey, bro, whoa, how's Manhattan? Why don't you get over here to Brooklyn? And he goes, nah, I really like, I like the village. It's great, it's great. And I said, hey, man, looking forward to meeting you. You know, stay safe. And I never got the chance to do that That's dinner. That's crazy. And, to have yeah, so yeah. much, so, I mean, to have so little time. I mean, you only had a few years to know so many guys yeah like that oh, early was, on like that's crazy Lou, it was haunting for a while and then later on i'll kind of connect it to to one of the stories but yeah but i got to 105 and the first greeting i got was from a legendary senior man named peter bartholomew hespy and i walked in with a with a, at the time i guess was a decent amount of money it was a 15 dollar uh chocolate fudge cake and i'll never forget it one of the guys in that picture is chris bogan he went to 158 truck and on our last day of class, he says, uh, excuse me, sir, should we bring a cheesecake to the firehouse? And and our senior instructor was this guy, Tommy Crepin from, from 48 Truck. And he was lifted. He got lifted. He was there. He was pissed off. And we made him this two-foot-long chop with coat stripes. And it said, to the ultimate truckie, firefighter Crepin, thanks for the experience. And it's actually still up at the rock as a door stopper all these years later. And he took the shot. You fucking bop. You fucking <laughs> so, so Bogan asks him about bringing a cheesecake. He goes, no, you fucking asshole. No, Just bring a fucking chocolate cake. So one of the guys makes up a cadence. I'm a proby. You might say, don't bring cheesecake your first day. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, 105, you're right by juniors. You got to stop yeah, at juniors, okay, exactly. bro. But we used to call 158, like, randomly to bust his balls. Yeah, tell Bogan we got his cheesecake right swamp, here. Is that the Swamp Dogs? I forget what 158 <laughs> is. I think so, yeah, yeah. yeah, anyway, right, yeah. So, so I get to 105, and this salty, tough old guy, it was Peter Bartholomew Hespy, and they called him No Toes Pete. And I never realized this, but my instructor in the academy was Jay Tavalero. He was a lieutenant, and he was an old 102 guy. And he called my first lieutenant in 105, uh, Bill Mudry, William Thomas Mudry, or as he's affectionately known, the Mud Man. And he gives him the, the hit on me. And and I was a, I tried to be a model probe. And Lieutenant Mudry says, Lieutenant Tavalero called and says, you're a piece of shit. And I went, sir? He goes, just kidding, kid. I got a real good draft report on you. But Lieutenant Tavalero, when he was a fireman at 102, his signature move was to ram the aerial up into the cornice to lift it and vent the roof. So Pete was in 105, caught in the roof just as Jay shot the aerial. And it jumped up the roof. And Pete the saw kicked up and literally cut off his left foot, like all the toes. Oh, man. Inside the boot. So they raced him up to Bellevue and they sewed his foot back on. So unbeknownst to me, this, my favorite instructor is the guy who, who messed Pete up, right? So I walk in the door and Pete Hespy goes, what's your name, scumbag? I go, sir, <laughs> I'm Nels Jorgensen. He goes, who's your father, scumbag? Now, at the time, 105, you had to be a chief's son. Right, you had to be. That's the right. West Point, right? That's West Point. West Study point. house, baby. Yes. Yep. Yes. So my the, the pro we before me was Jimmy Chapman, whose father was a three-star chief. So I make the mistake. Now, my father was known as a really good, good guy in fire prevention. And he worked for Chief Feehan, God rest him. And Chief Feehan said to him, he said, hey, Paul, he goes, where does your kid want to go? He says, well, chief, he says, he was really hoping for Tally Ho, 105, 148. You know, I was a Staten Island guy. I didn't want to travel all too far and whatever. And and so Chief Feehan says, do you think he'd study? He says, oh, yeah, Chief, he's he's definitely into it. He'll want to be, you know, he'll want to study. So he says, Paul, I'm going to send him the 105. So my, my father's only experience with 105 is there was a legendary old timer, Hank Miller, who, who was banged up pretty bad for a long time with his lungs. And my dad took care of Hank down to fire prevention. He, you know, he would, he would do the right thing, you know, come in the whole bit, the light duty job. You know, my dad was like, he ran the whole office and he, he always looked out for his guys. So anyway, Hank was always, you know, love my dad for that. So I make the mistake of saying to Pete, who, he says, who's your father, scumbag? I said, well, sir, he's just a fireman. He goes, just a fireman? Just, I'm just a fireman, scumbag, and you're just a fireman, scumbag? I said, no, sir. I said, he's not a chief. I said, he's not. I don't want to fucking hear it. <laughs> <laughs> that is the worst thing you could say, though, really, right? Oh, look. 
and, and I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't make it up. Like I couldn't get it back. No, you can't it get it back cake. in the bottle. That's it. The no, genie's no, out. It was done. It was done. The damage yeah, was yeah. done. Takes my cake, fires it into the trash, steps on, <laughs> and I'm going. Oh, it's going to be a long twenty years. And, and you know, but but I realized that from the minute I got there, they were testing me out. And my lieutenant, my first lieutenant, was a tough, tough guy. And in today's world of feelings he'd probably be terminated sued and everything else because he he would and test you and make you better and who's dogs and more. those are mine i'm gonna go up there and kill them <laughs> are you kidding me <laughs> <That's> dude <laughs> but anyway um yeah so boss Mudry, he got the field report from lieutenant tavalero at the rock and and i'll tell you what uh, i only was there for three years unfortunately um but I learned more in those first three years from Boss Mudry and some of the legendary guys. Um, some of the, you know, some guys were, were hard asses. And, and looking back now, I think they were a little bit vicious because they waited a few years on an order to get to the truck. And um, they held that against, me, you know, and they were really ruthless. And, and I did I did the best I could. You know, I tried to be a good pole. And um, they still was never good enough for them. And, and Boss Murphy understood that. And he, he he understood what exactly was going on. And But what he would do is, it made it even worse. He'd make me his irons man because he wanted to, to show them he was in the boss, not them, and that I was making the grade. And I said to him one day, I said, boss, I'm sorry, but you put me in a bad spot giving me the irons over a guy with eight, nine years. He said, I'm the fucking lieutenant. I'll pick who's my irons man. Yeah, but you can't and do I learned that just from, from time all the time, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah. And, and it put me in a bad spot, you know. But at the same time, I learned <laughs> rapidly. You know, I caught my first job on the irons with a guy who had 12 years from another yeah, truck. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah, it's and, good. You know, a banging third alarm on arrival. And the boss just looked at me. He goes, you got it? And, and, I, and I, so I had to learn quicker. You know, it was a lot of pressure. And Boss Mudry, I was a truck driver. That was my side gig. And I, and I started driving trucks at 17 years, well, 15 years old illegally. But so he knew that. And as a probie, he put me up in the cab and he'd make me drive the truck. And, and the, the guys who got him were okay with it. But the guys who didn't get him were furious. And he was molding me to be a chauffeur. And I remember we'd go to Prospect Park and he'd stand behind the rig 50 feet back and say, stop the rig when it touches my nose. And he'd be splitting my mirror. And I said, boss, he goes, you know how to drive trucks, drive the rig. And I'd back it up and I'd stop it as close to his nose as possible. And he'd go, do it again. And I'd only be two inches from his nose. <laughs> he'd make me pull it up and do it again. And if I started pissing on the brake like that, he'd say, stop, do it again. So I had to come in at, you know, maybe two, two mile glide, three mile an hour glide and stop it on his nose. Mm, and then I wouldn't do that. <laughs> the forest, and, and, he, and Peter B, Peter Bartholomew would make me go up in that bucket for two hours at a time and go up and down the corner of the building six inches away. And he goes, yeah, You're that I could see. Me. Yeah, 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 scrubbing I, mean, I could see. Absolutely. Yeah, they were tough. They they were tough and they trained me hard, but they trained me right. And and I tried to take some of those styles that I learned with me as a lieutenant by that but by that time the job had changed a little bit and guys' feelings would get hurt. You know, Kevin what, Kevin what, Kevin, what, Kevin, hold on, Nils. Kevin Malone yeah. in the chat wants to know how big was this guy's nose? <clears throat> <laughs> Wasn't no bigger than this one. No shit. Was uh was Grasso there when you were there? He got there, Jimmy he was the pro after me, and and I was only with Jimmy, not the longest. I think maybe uh I caught him for a year or so. Yeah, because I came on I came on with him. Yes, and I got hurt and then I left. But um but I learned more in that three years. And what happened was, um, I'm not embarrassed to say it. Um, I was a little bit thrown off when Jimmy Young, uh, when, it's not, excuse me, not Jimmy, when Kevin burned to death, I lost my mojo a little bit. I lost my edge. I lost, I, 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 I kept having these doubts of saying, oh God, maybe I'm next. Maybe I'm next. 
And I was, I went in, I was going in to talk to Lieutenant Ed Moriarty about it, that I, I was having some issues. What should I do is, is maybe it's best to transfer. And with that, we get a run and we go to a pin job and it was a legit, you know, person trapped and we worked hard and we cut him out. And all of a sudden we go 10, eight and we're going against the one way on class and crossing Atlantic. And there's a 1075 confirmed people jumping. And rescue was right in front of us. And as we crossed class in, uh, across Atlantic, two livery cars doing about 70, T-bone the fire truck. They bent the rig. And I had lines, and I got thrown inside the cab, and I smashed my back and my hip violently. And I ended up, the, the, the cars were on fire, and I ended up jumping out to hit them with a can, and my legs just failed, and I went down to the ground. And Tommy Wolgen, God bless him, he, he's a dear friend. And uh, there's a connection to Tommy years and years later. And I said to Tommy, I can't move, something's wrong. And he goes, okay, Jorgie, don't move. And they got on the radio and they gave an urgent and rescue turned around. And I'll never forget this. I believe it was Leah Elpi. They came and our guys were banged up pretty good. Everybody in the rig got banged hard. And rescue boarded me and said to the medics, listen, intubate him, do whatever, uh, they, I'm sorry, if he needs intubation, intubate him, catheterize him, whatever you need to fucking do, you do it. We're running interference, we're going to Bellevue. And rescue, all I can remember is horns for like 20 minutes, and they're bombing down, down Flatbush Avenue, and we bomb over down to the, uh, I guess we went over Manhattan Bridge and then shot up into, into the FDR, and it may have been the Brooklyn Bridge at that point. I'm not even sure. But all I remember is getting to Bellevue Hospital in like 12 freaking minutes. And I remember the rescue guys carrying me in. And they said, brother, we got to go back to Brooklyn. There's work. You'll be okay. You're in good hands. And I looked up with tears in my eyes. And I said, thank you, rescue. And I ended up writing them a letter down the road. And I got there. And I said to the doctor, what's wrong with me? He says, we're not really sure. We'll find out. So with that. My dad was still on a job and Chief Gancy, God rest him, was was our chief in the five seven. And he had since gone to the first division. So he heard us in the wreck. He flew over to Bellevue and I remember him walking in and I says, Chief, I think I'm paralyzed. And I started crying and he took my hand. He says, kid, listen, don't worry about this, Nels. You'll be OK. I'm going to get your family. Let's let's just take one step at a time. So my father-in-law was retired at the time from 148, and he, he, he had a really bad, bad injury. He only did 10 years, broke his back. So there's my mother, my father, my father-in-law, my, my Irish mother-in-law who I adored, my brother-in-law and my wife, and in walks with them holding their hands is Father Michael Judge. Now, I'd seen Father Mike at a couple boxes, and he gave us a quick blessing and whatever, but I never did get a chance to have a conversation. So they needed a hand loading me into the CAT scan tube. And I said to Father Michael, I says, Father, I'm, I'm Catholic. And I'm on, a, I'm on a Sunday 24 straight up and down. I miss mass. Maybe they can get me to the chapel in the morning. And he looked at me and he laughed. He says, Nels, if you try to tell God what you're doing tomorrow, he is going to laugh at you. He says, mm -hmm. but let us get through tonight and we'll see you in the morning. And he put his Irish hands on my head and he said he did a prayer. And he said, please, God, look after my son here and get him through this safely tonight and let him be OK. And they sent me through the tube. I came out a couple hours later, still can't really feel, you know, my feet and my hands. And, and one of the fire department doctors in their wisdom said, oh, maybe you're just hyperventilating. And the Bellevue doctor looked at him and said, no, nah, he's not hyperventilating. Right? So, hyperventilating. Long story, they, 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 they said, <clears throat> it looks like this swelling up in your vertebrae, in your cerebral ver uh, cervical vertebrae, but we can't see anything specific. So when the swelling came down, um, they sent me home four days later and they say, no, it was just like a stinger. You're okay. And the strange thing is six years later, I ended up in a, in a, in a collapse and I'm back in the catch game. And the doctor says to me at that point, he goes, whoa, what are you doing on the job? And I says, Doc, what do you, what do you mean? 
And he goes, you got a full fracture of cervical seven right across, right through, but it's all filled in with arthritis. He goes, did you break your back? And I said, doc, not, I said, well, I had a bad injury back in 93. And I, he goes, well, what happened? I said, well, Father Michael Judge put his hands on me and prayed. And then I went in the tube and he, he was an Irish guy. He goes, okay, then I know you're, <laughs> he goes, then I know what happened. He goes, you're good. Go back to work. And I'm like, what? He goes, I can't really explain what Father Judge did, but he said they didn't pick up on what was happening then, but there's no dispute that you broke your vertebrae back then. And, and I, I look, some people who don't believe, maybe they think I'm out of my mind, too much chemo, too much Irish whiskey, I don't know. But I, I want to think that Father Mike, you know, <clears throat> pulled me a favor, right? And, and oh, yeah. yeah, so... So that was it for me. I, I realized then that I, I lost my edge. So I, I put in a paper and I went out to Staten Island and I was shaken up. And after that injury of not being able to walk, I, I was scared shit and I'm not embarrassed to say it. And I got out to Ladder 82 and nice bunch of guys. You know, mm -hmm. I, I got a couple of my lifelong friends that I've made since that short time there. And I'll never forget it. My first night tour, I'm, I'm checking every tool and I got the hearse tool off the rig and the airbags and the saws and... And this guy smoking a cigar, leaning against the wall, the chief, and he walks over and he says, how you doing? I said, oh, hello, sir. And I gave him a salute. He says, you're new around here. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. He says, what's your name? I said, I'm, I'm Nels Jorgensen. He says, well, I'm Chief Charles Casper. How are you? I said, very well, sir. Charlie really Casper. Casper. Yeah. And he goes, <clears throat> just like this, he says, what the fuck are you doing out here? <laughs> Because, because I think you know, everybody's had that guy. at some point in their career. Well, and I don't mean that as a, as a knock to 82, but you know. No, no, of course not. Of they, course. They weren't knocking the dead, you know. And he saw my enthusiasm. He saw how I was really into it. And he says, can I have a minute? I said, yes, sir. He says, well, what's your deal? What's going on? I said, sir. And I told him the whole story. I said, I lost one of my best friends. And I said, I, 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 I got hurt pretty bad in a fire truck wreck. And I says, I'm a little thrown off right now. And he said, that's okay. He says, you'll get it back. But he said, do me a favor. The minute you're ready, come in and talk and we'll get you somewhere. And after about three months, I realized I made a huge mistake. And I was in good standings with 105. Lieutenant Mordry was very upset that I left because he taught me so much. But the senior man of the company, who was a legendary guy, Bob Kazmarek, Bob was this big mountain of a man. He played professional baseball. And he loved the firehouse dog. And Bobby used to send a dog home with me in between tours. I, I wasn't allowed to work 24s for, for like a year or six months. My, my captain, Norbert, at the time was an old school guy. You had to earn that right. Mm. So I'd take the dog home in between tours. So I was golden with Kaz. Kaz I was his boy. And I, and I also played baseball as a kid and whatever. So we, we had a bond. But what happened one day was one of the senior guys, I had about two and a half years, <laughs> He started messing with the dog and he was sticking this wooden spike up the dog's ass. And the dog what? bit him like bad. Nah, don't figure. So he started, <laughs> the brothers, yeah, right? He started kick, right? So he started kicking the shit out of the dog. And I hadn't said a word in two and a half years. I kept my mouth shut, right? And all of a sudden I turn around, I said, get the fuck off the dog. And the guy looks at me, he says, excuse me, you bop. I said, you kick that dog one more time. I'll kick you across the fucking apparatus floor, asshole. <laughs> so all of a sudden I got 16 you guys. Whoa, you're out of line, kid. Go fucking sit in the house watch. So now, you know, telephone, tele telegraph, telephone. And I'm the bad guy. I got a big mouth. I want to beat up the senior guy. So Kaz comes in and I greet him. He says, hey, kid, what's going on? I said, oh, nothing, Kaz. And I'm thinking, oh, the minute Kaz hears this, I'm in a lot of trouble. Sure as shit, three minutes later, Kaz comes storming into the house watch and slams his hand down on the glass. I thought he was going to shatter it. He goes, kid, you tell me what happened in that kitchen right now. I want to know every detail. So I'm like, okay, Kaz. And I'm going, oh, he's either going to punch me out or CD 30 me. I'm, I'm out. I, so I tell him exactly how it went down, and he punches the glass again. He goes, kid that ever fucking happens again you knock that fucking guy out you understand me and you said that ordered you to knock him out and i went yes sir he went in he grabbed that guy by the throat threw him up against the wall from that point on i could commit murder and i was still kaz's guy so <laughs> when i left and i called kaz about coming back and he said kid if you want to come back home you come back home you tell me 
But what happened in the interim was I had done my engine detail in 219. And a legend of the department at the time was an engine boss, Dennis Oberg Sr. And I did my engine detail with Dennis. And he respected that I loved the job so much. So Dennis was a 114 man. And he was in very good standing with Chief Feehan. And he went back home to Tally Ho as a lieutenant. So in that interim of leaving, I saw Dennis at a function. And he said, what are you doing? I said, boss, I made a mistake. I, I really love Brooklyn. I want to be back. And he goes, look, he goes, I got some spots. He says, 105 is 33 guys. I don't think you'll get back. And, and he said, speak to Lieutenant Bauman about it. Now, Lieutenant Bauman was one of my lieutenants in 105, legendary guy. And he was a 114 fireman. There was a big connection between Tally Ho and 105 for many, many years with many guys. You know, just like, um, you know, when you guys had Mac on talking about the guys in Harlem and the Bronx, how they stay close. Well, that was the same shock grouping. 105 and, 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 and 114 and 219 and 201, they had this little tight shock grouping. Guys would stay. So I asked Bobby Bauman his advice. And he said, look, Nels, it's not that you're not welcome back. But he said, I've been married twice, but I'd never marry the same woman again. He goes, yeah, it's I think tough you'll to go really back. Like I was going to say that. It's not easy to go yeah. back once and you make Louis, that. Because the haters, the haters who hated me from the beginning were going to hate even harder. And, and I didn't want to start throwing down, right? Because then it was going to be, I was going to have to throw down. Now I got four years and you're going to get a guy brutalizing you. You know, you only take so much. Mm. So I realized it. And I said, you know. My, I just, you know, I was a Brooklyn kid, and I remember as a little kid, if there was work, you know, we lived in Bay Ridge, so if there was work in Bay Ridge or Sunset Park, my dad, we'd buff it, go down, and I just remember seeing the big share mark on the side of the rig, and, and you know, they used to call it the church truck back then. They would actually go to my church, 10-8, and, and they would be in church while we were at Mass. So, so Bobby gave me the wink. He said, listen, I'm going to tell you now, you can't do wrong. I got to Tally Ho, and I, I figured out in five minutes, oh, yeah, okay. 105 was great, but I really loved the single truck aspect. And nothing right. against the engine again, but it was super, super tight. You know, it was, we got, there's no who's got the meal, who's got the watch, who's got this, who's you got, got everything. that. You got it. You got it. You want to fuck mm -hmm. up a meal, you fucked it up. You want to mess up a watch, you messed it up. And they were just super tight. And, and my first, second maybe first second tour there we catch a banging job and who's relocated but 105 and i look in quarters and there's bill mudry on the bumper of the rig and now i'm saying this is my mentor this is my idol how do i face this man and i walked up and i saluted him and i said hey boss good to see you and i put my hand out and he put his hand out and he says kid good to see you i'm glad you're back in the borough but you're in the wrong truck <laughs> right and he goes but good luck you made he goes you made a good second choice and i went thanks boss and every ever since that point we were golden i'd catch them at multiple alarms this and that and and you know the mud man one mm. of my men in 105 tommy woods he's a captain still on the job and uh i think tommy's the captain 308 now and woodsy is just 39 years on the job one of the best guys in the world and he was one of those kind guys that would always take me to the side and tell me I was doing okay. I was doing a good job. Don't worry about it. And Woodsy said to me, he goes, Mudman was so happy you came back to the borough. And I said, yeah, but I let him down. He says, he goes, Jorgy, if the Mudman could pick out his Wyatt Earp commercial, he goes, he'd be in the middle, walking down the middle of the street to a gunfight. And you'd be on his left. And this other guy would be on his right. He says, but trust me, he loves you. And, and I, I felt like I broke my father's heart. Like, I love this mm. man so much. I idolized him. We have a him. picture of him? Uh, you know, I don't. And that's the strange thing. The mud man was an elusive character. He didn't like pictures. Mm. That's, that's <laughs> Dennis O'Berg. My, my, that's Dennis O'Berg on the left who, who took me and gave me a shot, you know. And, and Dennis is one of the best human beings. He lost his son, Dennis Jr., who was a pro in 105. And this is the irony that breaks my heart. In 1993, I was at the first bombing with one of the sweetest, best senior men in the world, Henry Miller, who knew my dad. And after the fact, after Kevin Shea was, you know, was, you know, brought back out of the hole and everything had wound down. This was a couple hours later. We we're in there overhauling and Hank's looking around and he says, you know what, kid? They didn't do it right. He says, if they did it in a corner, they would have dropped these buildings to Canal Street. Mm. He says, but they're going to be back, kid. 
and they'll succeed the next time. And the strange irony is on the morning of 9-11, Dennis, my, my boss, my, my second idol and mentor, his, his probie son, Dennis, was killed with Hank. Yeah. And, and 50, 50 yards away was my childhood best friend, Johnny Sharp from Engine 201. And it just, it just broke my heart. Like all these connections to these beautiful yeah. guys that I wow. loved. And, and, and it was such a tight grouping. And, and then in 94, just before I got to Tally Ho, and I got the call about the Watch Street fire. And I said, who was working? And my, and my buddy knew, he says, I hate to tell you this. I said, who was working? And he named Captain Drennan and he named Chris and he named Jimmy and my heart broke. It sunk. And, and I, I just said to myself, I, I, this, I used to think at times I got paid to laugh and I have to say most of my career, I truly did get paid to laugh, but sometimes I got paid to cry my eyes out. And, and I just, um, it, it just reinforced what a blessing life is when when it hits you that close you realize wow you know what we're, we're on borrowed time we're fragile human mm. beings i mean you know we think we're bulletproof right at times we're firemen i was a cop i was a soldier we're fucking bulletproof and then all of a sudden you go no i ain't so fucking bulletproof at all you know but um but yeah Niels, who's in that picture who's in that picture with you in the bucket that's oh, that's up. Uh, that's Johnny Garland and Johnny Garland. Oh God, Johnny is a funny, funny character. So my first day walking in, walking into Tally Ho, Johnny ended up a lieutenant in 148, and then he retired out of ladder 82. And Johnny is one of those guys in my life. He's just my voice of reason. Every week the phone will ring, and he'll give me like a therapy session about what matters, what don't. Um, you know, Johnny. I'll put it to you this way, Johnny. <laughs> It's one of those guys from an anonymous organization who saved hundreds of guys' lives. And I don't I didn't need an intervention in that way. I needed a I'm dying of cancer intervention. And Johnny rescued me. But the first day I walk into quarters, he goes, Hey, how you doing, kid? You hear from Tally O? I go, Yeah. He goes, You drive? Like and at the time I was a chauffeur. I go, Yeah. He goes, All right, well, let me explain things how things work around here. He goes, First of all, I shook the commissioner's hand first, which makes you a bop, right? So Johnny had to talk about 15 years. He goes, so what that means, kid, is any shit that comes down the pike, anytime you fucking got it, welcome to Tally Ho. And I go, fuck this guy. But Johnny was the best teacher, mentor, coach. Johnny could see from 50 yards out that a guy was having a bad day. And he partake in the ball breaking, right? He barbecued you like a steak, just like everybody else. But then when the crowd just faded away, take you to the side and put his arm around you and say, what's eating at you, kid? What's going on? How's things? And, mm. and Johnny's just that one guy, you know, he's only in his 60s, so he's not old enough to be my dad. But I love the man so much. He's such a character, the typical old school guy smoking a cigar and, and just breaking balls and a million great stories. Mm. And he, he used to call himself the leader of the rebel front because, you know, some of the guys in the old guard, they had their way of doing things. And Johnny was one of those freewheeling guys who felt everybody had a say, everybody had something to put into the soup, and he <clears> had everybody <throat> put it in. And, uh, yeah, he's a great – How much great. time did he do? Johnny did, I think, 28, and he came down with a heart ailment um back johnny would have had about 40 years now and uh yeah so probably about a dozen years ago he came down with a heart scare and he's living a dream man he's doing oh, good. He's still he's alive. that's big, good oh yeah no johnny's a great golfer he was a golf coach at wagner college for a while <clears throat> and um he's nice. just he's just a great individual yeah and and one of the many guys in tally ho that just it's such a gentleman shop and i don't mean that as a shot to any other company out there but like when Marty McGovern, I walked in the door and Marty was toward the end of his career. And Marty was literally almost burned to death rescuing a couple of ladies way, way back in the 70s. And when you sat next to Marty, you could look through his ears because he had reconstructed ears from, from like skin from, I don't know where they even took it, from the back of his hand. No shit. And he was caught in a flashover getting these people out. He went back in thinking there was somebody else when it flashed over and he got trapped. And when you met this guy, there was no rah-rah. There was such a, a, such a loving feeling coming from him. And he would talk to the probie 
like he talked to the guy with 30 years. But he'd expect you to do your job. Mm. And and he, I never forget it. I, it was a change of tours. He wouldn't drink at work. And, and he says, come on, kids, sit down and have a grinner. And I said, Marty, what's a grinner? He goes, Budweiser. After three of them, you got a grin on your face. Come on, let's <laughs> grin. And that was Marty. He just, right? He just wanted to love and laugh and live. And his son was a broker who died in the towers. Oh, and Marty shit. retired and lived the natural environment down in Arizona. And he's since passed. But yeah, so, so Tally Ho got hit. In, you know, we lost Jimmy Riches. He was over in Engine 4. And then Lieutenant Oberg lost his son. Uh, Marty lost his son. Chief Petroselli from the 4-0, he lost his son, who was a broker. Um, Chief Henry lost his son, who was on duty. Didn't um, Petroselli have another uh, son who was in 105, bro? Yes. Chief yeah. Al Jr. since retired. And Al, Al got there just after I left. And I just ran into Al on 9-11 at the 105 Mass over in St. Joseph's. And Chief Petroselli passed away last year from COVID, unfortunately. Oh, shit. And, and Al Jr. just decided it was time to spend more time with family. He had his time, and he got out. And, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I was in but, probie uh, school with Al and his son. Special place. What's that? Yeah, what, What's that? I, I was in probie school with Al Jr. When, when did um, 114 uh, go in with 201? When did that, that – you were gone if, before that happened? I was gone. You know, Coop, shame on me for not knowing the date, but I'm thinking it was like 05 – and and oh, they, it is that late. Huh? I, I don't even remember. Night and, or, maybe, or maybe you know what? I got made in 02, right? And we were on Fifth Avenue. And I'm thinking it was about maybe 04. It was probably a good couple years after I left. And I remember the close down night. We I should have sent you guys that picture and I forgot it. And it was a great night. It was a bittersweet, sad night because that firehouse was so special. It was one of the last two remaining, I think. 15 Engine had just gotten closed prior to it. Yeah. And Tally Ho was, I think, two of the last remainders with, with uh, a spiral staircase. And they had the slats in the concrete floor for the horse piss back in the day, right? They, they would, <laughs> the horses would pee and take a crap. And the piss would drain off into the side to the troughs. And then the pro beat have to, to shovel up the horse shit, which probably would be offensive nowadays, right? Because, you know, that's offensive. But uh, You want me to do yeah, what? And, and, oh, and no, I just, can't do that. Such yeah. a place. <laughs> yeah. The new, the new firehouse I, is I really nice, guys, though. You there, bro? What, what's that, Coops? I said the new firehouse yeah, is really listen. nice. You got the battalion in there, too, right? Oh, it's, it's nice. a beautiful wow. building. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful building, but... But there was something special about being in a building from 1895, right? And, and you know. Uh, well, being, just, a, uh, being uh, a single uh, truck, too, is it, cool, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm sorry. I'm having a little bit of a phone issue right now. I lost you for a second. Uh -oh. but, um, uh, what, what was that, Coops? I said being a single truck is cool, too, man. You know, that's something in itself. Oh, yeah. No, it was beautiful. I used to love standing in the building when, when it changed the tours, when a rig would leave. And I'd stand up in the bunk room and you'd hear the building creaking. And I'd look at the old wooden lockers and go, wow, man, it was guys in like 1895 that were changing here. Right. And, and you know, I remember they, my dad used to say they used to work, I don't know, like like six days a week. Right. And on the seventh day, guys could go home to see their family and go get a haircut and, and you know, come back. And, and I used to just I love the history of the FDMR. I was just so intrigued by it. And and I just, I used to stand there just trying to put myself back to those times. And there was so many funny, funny, like when we literally walked out that night and I realized we could never come back. Yeah, that's weird. That's a I, weird, uh, that would be weird. Yeah, it, was, it, it, was, it was like a funeral, right? And and yeah. I looked from the bunk, the bunk room door facing back. And in my mind, I was only in Tally for eight years, but it was my lightning in the bottle, right, of my life. It was it was just I, I, I was coming of my own. You know, I got there as a chauffeur and, and, and I, I got, you know, I got my confidence back and I became a much better fireman. And I was with a bunch of gentlemen that just loved the job, loved the history, loved, so proud of the company. And when I when I looked in that bunk room, I had this brief flash of all the funny, funny moments. And I'll never forget. One of the old timers, Greg Warnock, the bug man, he was, he's such a gentleman. And I, I never forget like on the cold, uh, the hot, uh, hot summer, summer nights, and we'd run this big air conditioner in the back and Greg would tiptoe in. You'd hear the door creak. You'd hear him tiptoeing up the spiral staircase and then the door would creak. 
And he, he'd get into the chauffeur's bunk, which was right at the end by the door. And he'd rustle the covers. And then all of a sudden, you'd hear him go, <sighs> when i would be at home and it would be nice and the air conditioner would run in, and i would do that and my kids to this day will still come in when they feel the air conditioner go a legendary guy mike gibbons who's a who could That's be a funny. stand-up comedian right and i only work with gibbo for a short time and he came back as the captain after i was gone and mike was one of the most funny friggin guys ever <laughs> and a couple guys they like to walk around in towels and be like half nude you know and and, and mike, you know, mike was one of them so um, in in that picture from that 114 picture with the guys one of the guys is a legendary guy larry lee and he was one of the only asian guys that i ever met on a job at the time you know now obviously there's a lot more but but larry is He's a funny, funny character and doesn't realize it half the time. He's really tough, like scares the shit out of new guys. But but when he's got a couple in him, he's a fucking riot. So so Gibbo used to mess with Larry to no end. And one day Gibbo is sitting there on the bunk and he's got his towel on. And all of a sudden he goes, hey, Larry, I got a real ba bad case of the crotch crickets. You want to do me a favor? Can you lift up my balls while I spray this tenactin on my balls? <laughs> <laughs> So he goes, all right, Larry, I'll tell you what, I'll lift up my balls, you spray. And Larry, <laughs> out, you know? and then another day, this other guy, this guy, Jimmy, would just walk around balls ass naked. And, and like, look, I'm Irish, so I don't really have much to be proud of. And one day, Gibbo goes, Jesus, Jimmy, put that thing away, please. He goes, you, you look like a German soldier in World War II peering out of the bushes. He goes, what, what are you proud of? And, and just, I mean, the one-liners and the ball busting and the laughs, constant. And when I closed that door for the last time, I teared up. I said, this, it's over. Like, at least when you promote out and you pass your firehouse on to guys, you know they're going to perpetuate right, the right, ball busting. Right. But it, it ended that day. But now it's 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 a new cast of characters. You got a double company with a battalion, and, and they're mixing it up, you know. But, <laughs> Hung like a doorbell, yeah. Mikey said. <laughs> Hung like a doorbell. Hung like, like a doorbell. doorbell. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And it's funny because when you say the doorbell, back when they were giving out the the the, uh, the mosquito spray during the West Nile virus. I remember the, the, the doorbell would just ring nonstop, one in the morning, two in the morning, three in the morning. And, and I remember this one guy rings the bell at like 3.30 in the Bram. morning. And this guy, Kev, Kevin's on the house watch. And he goes, what? Uh, excuse me, you got that mosquito prey? Kevin goes, yeah, I got a mosquito prey. <laughs> he fucking throws a case of it out of the side and closes the door. And, and this was the same guy. You got that mosquito prey? <laughs> and Kevin, Kevin walks in, transferring from 104 truck. Don't know a soul, right? He goes, Walks in the kitchen. He goes, yeah, how you doing, you hot aunts? I'm Kevin Ogan for 104. Where's the beat-off room in this fuck shop? And some of the funny you got funny that stuff, spray. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's going to be Mojito spray. And, and just, you know, because we were we were a depot. Back then, the mayor made us depots, right? You know, fire department will do everything. And um, But some of, the, some of the funny, funny stuff. Oh, and I'll never yeah. forget it. Probably get in trouble for this. Um, yeah, one yeah. of the best, one of the best bosses I ever had was the Duke, was uh, John McGuire, right? And John was just, just a fantastic gentleman and great, great personality, dry sense of humor. But I'll never forget it. Larry and another guy, Billy, decide they're going to make wine on the veranda. So Larry, Larry, you know, would say, "Yeah, we're going to make vino on the veranda," and and Skipper, the Duke, was like, what? So, no, oh, no, it's all, we're off duty, we're off duty. So here's Billy and Larry fucking gooned up, drinking, washing their feet. They got brand new garbage pails loaded with grapes, and they're stamping the Come shit Come on. Of I swear to God. And the captain's going, oh, guys. And they hit it. They, they had it covered. No one would know. So all of a sudden, I guess it takes, I don't know, six, eight, ten weeks to ferment. So Billy. Billy and Larry bottle the wine and they give each guy in the company like six bottles. And I take the wine home and I like, I like wine, you know, Irish Danish guy, you're supposed to not like wine. But I love red wine. And I drink a sip of this wine and I go, Oh my God, this is the greatest wine I've ever freaking tasted. Come and on. 
I swear to God. And my wife is not much of a cook, but she goes, she goes, I hate wine. This is really good. So I finish off the bottle. Then I, I split another. I, I bring a bottle over to my neighbor and he goes, oh, man. This is fucking great. Where'd you get this? I go, Sunset Park, Brooklyn. He goes, they got a winery? I go, yeah, Ladder 114. So I come back to work. And I go, guys, I go, that's the best wine ever. And they go, we know, but we forgot the fucking recipe. We were drunk. We were drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and got that wine. And I, to this day, I've never had a better, a better glass of wine, you know? That's but great. Yeah, and, and some of the funny, funny guys like Bobby Little Adams, cheese. You had a little cheese. Little, little yeah, yeah. the cheese and, in there, you know? And, uh, Toe cheese. One, one of the funniest guys that I ever worked with. He's still a dear friend, Bobby Adams. He's a lieutenant 174. And Bobby just would come out with some of the funniest shit. Like, like he or met me. I ended up buying a yellow Beetle, a Volkswagen Beetle, because my car broke down on Christmas Eve night at the firehouse, and, and I walked up to Bay Ridge Volkswagen before they closed, and, and I got early. Release. You bought a Beetle? I walk in, Louie. I, I, I had a, I had a hand in my <laughs> man. Car, Interesting. Right? I needed a car. I had the hand in my man and, car. Uh, yeah. No, I, but I mean, how did you fit in the car? <laughs> well, believe it or not, well that car, right? That car was a little, a little smaller than a Beetle. That, that's my, uh, my stagehand job, and I was, I was the props, uh, working with props, moving those around. But yeah, it, it, I fit in a little better than that one, right? But anyway, um, so I go, I go up to Bay Ridge Volkswagen on Christmas Eve, and I got this Bensonhurst guy, home raised guy. He goes, "Yeah, how you doing? What can I do for you?" I said, "I'm fine, and down in Sunset Park." I said, "I'm really in a bad jam. I need a car." He goes, "Guy." What I got, you don't want. It's a yellow beetle. It's stick shift. And I marked it down five grand because no one wants it. I said, sold. He goes, guy, you're kidding me, right? I said, bro, look, I have no shame. I need a car. So I'm trying to keep it on a down low. So, so Bobby, I get home and I call the firehouse. And uh, he goes, oh, I guess you got a car. I go, yeah, I, I, what'd you get? He goes, I said, Bobby, I'm on. He goes, what the fuck did you get? I said, a yellow beetle. He goes, no way. Seriously. I said, no, I got a yellow beetle. A so I pull, up, I pull up Christmas night for the night tour and out runs the change of tours like eight guys. They pop my trunk and they all jump in the back of the Beetle. And they're like, come on, it's the clown wagon. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> and Bobby used to torment me. I'd pull up the quarters. He'd play the clown music. And, and some of the one-liners he'd come out with, he would barbecue me like a steak. I'd come in, and I look old, right? I mean, I don't exactly have a lot of hair, right? So anyway, anytime it was my birthday, he'd say, Joggy, uh, so how old are you? I said, Bobby, I'm 29 today. He goes, no, seriously, Joggy, like, like how old? I said, Bobby, I'm 29. He goes, my friend, I hate to do this to you, but I think Father Time has played a cruel joke. I think someone's <laughs> using your body when you're sleeping. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and then if I come in with my new... I and tight haircut. He goes, you got a haircut, right? I said, yeah. He goes, how much do they charge you for that? I said, oh, it was 12 bucks up in Bay Ridge. Yeah, Rob. He goes, they call that the waving dude, right? I go, the fuck? yeah, waving bye-bye, Joggy. And I'm like, because he's got this big head of <laughs> the hair. The waving you know? bye-bye. And, and just, just the funny, and, and then he talks about when he was a butcher. I'll probably get in trouble for this one, but he was the only white butcher in a black butcher shop back, like, <clears throat> in the early 80s. And on Christmas Eve, the boss came in with a couple bottles of, of scotch and their porn shots. And they're all talking about what they're going to do for Christmas. And Bobby is a real good imitator. So he's talking about the guy they called Chicken John. So he goes, so Chicken John, what are you doing for Christmas? He's like, takes his shot. He goes, Bobby, I want to get my Cadillac. I'm going to drive down to Carolina. I want to find my woman. And I'm going to F that P-U-S-S-Y till it smells like a burnt rubber boot. And he's like, oh, my God. Oh, my. Oh, my, 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 my. All right, we got, we got to get Shabbat, back. Shabbat, Shabbat back Shalom. Back here. That was my All right, we're going to move right along. All right, we're going to move along to when you got promoted. Let's go to 2002. No, 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 it's actually nah. hilarious. No worries. <clears throat> I don't get a cancel for that one. But, uh, nah, yeah, but Bobby is one of the. The, the funniest wordsmiths <laughs> I've ever met in my life. And he, he just like made it so fun. All right, so you spend, but, uh, uh, let's see, let's see, you got promoted in 2002. Correct, Mundo? So you had to yes, leave 114. Somebody I did. Um, I had to leave a little earlier than I wanted to. Um, when 9-11 took place, I, um, 
I went. I knew I was. I knew I was up for promotion. And at the time, they were asking for guys with some time to fill in in the companies. Unfortunately, that were hurt, killed. Unfortunately, in large numbers. And I called the guy at the transfer desk, and I said, "How you doing, brother?" And he goes, "Bro, if you're calling to ask for this company, this company, this company, hang up the phone right now. Don't waste my time." And I said, "Brother, where do you need me?" And he goes, "Okay." He says, "You drive?" I said, "Yes, sir. I've been towel out of show for." He goes, "How much time you got?" I said, "I got about 11 years, going on 12 years." He goes, "Okay, um, I need a guy in 15 truck." I said, "Okay." My probie just passed in engine four, uh, Jimmy Richie's. I said, um, send me down. So within three days of the trade center, I'm now assigned to ladder 15. And it was kind of haunting because they lost 14 guys. Mm. And I didn't know anybody except for Jimmy down there. So I walked in the door, stranger. And Johnny Viola, who was a legendary guy from Bradford Street, was a lieutenant there. And he gave me what was expected, what he needed. And I said, look, Lou, whatever, I'm just here. I, I'm just here to help. He goes, mm -hmm. we need honor for memorials. We need a chauffeur. We need a senior guy, you know, who knows a little bit to train these new guys. This, I said, yes, sir, whatever you need. And then Captain Tim McKinney from the truck was a Vietnam veteran. And he was fraught with guilt because he did a mutual with Lieutenant Joe Levy, who passed away that morning. And um, Joe was this a lot of four guys, a fireman, and you can hear their radio transmissions. They're up on the 78th floor. And Joe, God rest him, it sounds like it was just another routine fire. It was incredible how calm he was. Mm. And um, so Cap McKinney asked me if I'd be his backup chauffeur. And I said, it, it would be my honor, sir. And one of the strange sort of haunting, a couple haunting things from there was, aside from the sorrow and loss, because now the 14 families would come in. Mm -hmm. And I don't... And they would talk to me as if I knew their dad or their husband or their, you know, their father, their brother. And I, I didn't. Right. And it was embarrassed to tell them that. And it was hard to explain to them that I'm only filling in. And this young guy, Fitzroy Haynes Jr., who was a brand new probie. And on the morning of 9-11, he walked into quarters. And a senior guy, Tommy Kelly, was showing him around. And the run came in for the towers. And Tommy took Fitz and he threw him off the rig. And he said, go sit in the house, watch, do not move answer the phone, answer the computer. You do not go anywhere. This is bad. And Tommy Kelly passed away. Oh, wow. And Fitzy, Fitzy was haunted by that. And about four months later, Fitzy was on a search team down here and he found the baby shoe. And he said to the Lieutenant, he says, boss, I think someone's messing with us because um, this baby shoe, but no babies were killed in the trade center. And the boss said, hey, hold on a minute. There was a child on the plane and they bagged the shoe and this, the dogs got a hit and it turned out it was the little three-year-old child who was on the plane with her mother oh, shit. And, and, and the cruel irony to that is i've been doing a bunch of research lately <clears throat> and i never realized this a friend of mine from ireland that was a dear family friend of his he never told me in 20 years and his the lady's brother was on the street helping a lady who was horribly burned with jet fuel carried her to an ambulance and she ends up passing away a few days later. Unbeknownst to him, his sister and his niece are on that plane. And the lady's best friend, who was the child's godmother, was on the other plane. So I was telling this gentleman, Donal, my friend, about Fitzy finding the shoe. And he said to me, with tears in his eyes, he said, yeah, that, that young lady and her daughter was supposed to come to my house after oh, their trip God. to California, stay in my, get, stay in my, get my spare bedroom. <laughs> He said they were my neighbors in Ireland. And, this and is I like was a broken. movie, dude. This is like a yeah, movie. Of touch that and then this is the kicker. Fitzy had died six months before I got sick in 2011. He had a heart attack, and they said that the, the poisons, he was only 40. Now, Fitzy was a big guy. He was a Marine. His father was a Jamaican immigrant who was a Marine. This was and the probie who, who came in that probie. morning? <clears throat> yes. Found that baby shoe. And mm -hmm. in 2000, in 10, December of 10, he passed of a heart attack, and Come they believed on. that the, the, the compounds from the dust were eating away his heart valves, and he had a massive heart attack. And How old so was he? He was 40. Holy and, shit. And poor kid was haunted his whole time on the job, the fact that Tommy Kelly put himself in harm's way for him. Mm. And Fitz was just the sweetest guy with a big old smile, and he kept wow. asking me to bring up 
one twelve. He wanted to come. To, he lived in Brooklyn. That's a the sick. Fits when you're ready. Yeah, that's a crazy yeah, story, man. Game. And so then, wait, let me. I, I got to back yeah. up one. So you are a fireman in fifteen. You weren't promoted yet. That's correct. Oh, I okay. went down, out immediately. Okay, I got you. The McKinney, one of the higher honors in my life, Captain McKinney, again being a decorated Vietnam guy. He said, Nils, I could really use a hand. Would you come back? So in January of 03, I was covering. Oh, I see. I was covering, okay. the, 11th. I was covering the 11th for a while. And then I got to to 15 um, in January of 03. And then Captain McKinney came to me about a month or two later. And he said, I'm sorry to do this to you, but I have to retire. I can't do this anymore. Mm. And Cap, it's okay, sir. I, I totally understand. I'm going to try to do my best. And to be honest with you, it was really hard down there um, because there was the constant stream again of the families and, and the ghosts. And I, I just wanted to get back to Brooklyn where I felt comfortable. Mm. And I had this one chief down there that was a bit of a, I don't want to say whatever, but he, he was just a bit of a, a tool. And he, he didn't like me. And I, I guess because I wouldn't kiss his ass, you know, I, I wasn't, but I wasn't a cavalier asshole to the guy ever, but he, he gave a 1092 for a subway fire one day that we worked and I called him up. I said, say, chief, excuse me, but, uh, we operated, you gave a nine two. He says, yeah, you telling me how to, how to, uh, couldn't man my, my scenes. I said, no, but I'm telling you, I'm calling the UFOA. And I was marked for death after that. And I realized, mm -hmm. you know what? This isn't really where my heart is. And I felt terrible. And at the end of, at the end of 03, I wound up going back to Brooklyn. Um, and I went to 112. But I have to say my time in 15 was well spent. There was wonderful, wonderful guys. Some of the best firemen I've, I've ever worked with. And some of the greatest experiences. But one of the strangest experiences, and I just found out two weeks ago, uh, a month ago, the, the connection. One morning, Captain Rochelle Jones, who is the captain of Engine 4, and Rocky is good people, really. I, I tell you what, I saw leadership under fire down there between Johnny Viola, um, Charlie Noseworthy, Freddie Fuchs, uh, Tommy Ganey, uh, Rocky. I mean, and I'm, I'm probably missing, you know, uh, a couple guys, and I'm sorry. It's been so many years, but, but they really held that place together. And Rocky one morning says to me, this was in uh, – late September of, of 01, she said, Mrs. Tapmeyer's here. Would you mind taking um, young Eric downstairs to see the rig? So there's this little six-year-old boy, and his father was Paul. And Paul, I think, was assigned to 46 truck maybe in the Bronx, but he was down on a rotation. And he died. He was actually detailed for the day to 26 engine, but, you know, he was considered killed out of four, I guess. And, you know, it was it was kind of one of those – you know, where exactly was he? But anyway, as far as the little boy was concerned, that's where his daddy worked that day. So I take him downstairs and he sits on the rig and he says, can you tell me, Nels, can you tell me where my daddy sat that morning? And I'm looking at this little man who's six. My daughter at the time was going on five and I'm going, oh my God, how brave is this kid? So I said, well, Eric, I said, your daddy had to back up and he was sitting here. And I said, he goes, do you think my daddy was scared when he got into <clears throat> And I said, no, I said, he was very brave. And he closes his eyes and he puts his fists on his knees. And after about 10 seconds, he goes, my daddy's okay. Okay, let's go. And mm -hmm. we get the rig and he takes my hand and we walk upstairs. And I say to the captain, I says, Cap, um, like she was doing paperwork with, with Mrs. Tapmeyer, the widow's paperwork. And she could see the tears streaming down my face and I'm trying not to let the little man see it. And she goes, okay, Nels, we're good. And I went, thanks, Cap. And I walk away and I go into the locker room and I open up my locker and I look at the picture of my kids and I'm blowing my eyes out. Well, a few weeks ago, I open up the New York Post and it says that 69 kids have followed their parents, their fathers into the FDNY. And Eric Tapmeyer works in the Bronx. No oh, shit. And wow. And I want to shake his hand because... That I, I, you know, shame on me for not reaching back out over the years, hmm. right? Finding out where he was, but his his courage that that blew me away. And it's call the those, firehouse, man. Call it up. I'm, I'm, you know, because I think I think what it is too. Sometimes it sounds a little strange. You know what I mean? Like, hey, I haven't seen you now in uh, twenty. You know, but I. Well, I, no, I, but still, he probably yeah. remembers you. I mean, in the end, well, you know, I, you, I, you you'll remember that. Yeah. 
I, yeah. I, I wonder, but I, I, I never, I will never, even if he didn't get on a job, that was a moment I was taking with me to my grave. Like, mm. I, you know, and it, and it, re, it reaffirms to us how lucky we were to mm. walk out of there where these other guys didn't. Right. Yeah. What yeah. companies did he, is he working in? I, you, know, I, you know, I'm thinking he might have went to 46 himself. I, you know, shame on me again, Lou. I, I get a little absent-minded sometimes, but but I know he's in the Bronx, and I know he came on like a year or two ago, and I'm saying, wow, wow. I, I That's did, good stuff, man. Yeah, if that was my son, I would just be so, so friggin' proud, you know? Yeah, no, that's great stuff, man. Yeah. Those guys got a lot of, uh, you know, they're trying to fill some shoes but make their own shoes, yeah. you know what I mean? Yes, so, uh, yes. Exactly. They always got somebody watching, so it's good. Oh, absolutely, brother. Absolutely. So how do you get over to 112, bro? Just by happen circumstance? Well, <laughs> you know what? Oops, this is going to sound like bullshit, right? Listen, it, after all the shit you said tonight with this one, no one, this one, this I, one uh, I, is on the plane from this one, incredible. nothing's going to sound like bullshit. <laughs> this, this is my hand of God. This is my hand of God. I have my heart set on 148 because... We used to run in with 148, and I got to go back a little bit with Johnny Gollin, my mentor, the funny, funny shit in that area. So we had a really, we probably had the most ethnically diverse response area in the city, right? It was, we went into Bay Ridge, you had Irish, you had, you had Middle Eastern, you had, you know, uh, Scandinavian, then you come down, you had Puerto Rican, then you had Dominican, then you had uh Asian, and then you had Hasidic, Jewish. You got the mosquito spray, man. That's right. And mosquito spray. Yep. That, that's, I'm going to probably get in trouble for mocking, but that's just how Look at say. Pete's face. So, but anyway. I, you know, I'm I, laughing. I, you know, I, what am I going to tell you? We're going to be off the air. So we're going to be off the air for No, we're not. No, we're not. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's nice knowing you guys. Hey, Neil, we got this guy <laughs> named Tividar. I, I and, hope and from... put you guys out of business with this. No, 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 no. Neil, so, Neil, we got a guy named Tividar from Budapest. Is not he? He looks like he looks like you or me. He looks whiter right? than me and you. And whatever <laughs> we discuss, <laughs> Mister exactly. Tividar, we've used. We this talk thing. like this yes. when we Accent. talk about him. Yeah. Yeah. When you're breaking about. Bones. I used to I used to drive Boar's Head for my lieutenant Rick King and his partner, who's a retired rescue one guy, Don Salacito. I drove for them on and off for about 25 years. And we had an Indian customer named Tico. And unbeknownst to me, I recaptured with Tico a few years ago. He owns a liquor store in New Jersey where I, where I lived for a long time. And I still have a house part time. And he remembered me. He was, <clears throat> and and I, would, I still to this day will call up Don and Rick. And the guy goes, oh, my God, you're, you're the boss at Fireman. Yes, we, how is Don? How is Rick? So every couple of weeks, I'll call them up and say, pretend I'm the guy, Tico. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like some potato salad, please. And, and, they, <laughs> and, and they, they think it's him. You know, they, they, I, they, 30 years later, mess with them. And, and Rick King, God bless him, one day he's in the kitchen, right? And Rick's That's a character. Funny. And when he doesn't know I'm behind him. Now, I'm his driver. I'm his boar's head, steady, friggin' guy. Two 17-hour days a, a week. It was brutal. It was a tough job. And one of the guys, Paulie McManus, was talking about investing in, a, in an orange juice route with his brother-in-law. He says to Rick, he goes, Rick, what, what's the what's the key to, you know, routes? This and that. He goes, Paulie, listen, all you got to do is get a schmuck to drive your truck and you're golden. I go, oh, so that's it. I'm just the fucking schmuck driving the truck. <laughs> no, no, I really didn't. Oh, you were the driver. So for years, I was then, I was mm. the schmuck driver. Yeah, I was his driver. You got a schmuck. I was now the schmuck driver. Yeah. But anyway, I know but you still haven't asked me, tell how you got the ladder 112. All right, so I got I got to veer out, for, and I'm gonna veer back. I got ADD, PTSD, various other right. fucking ailments. I don't answer this. That. A B C D E F G. Go Just, it's just keep it around the clock. It's nine thirty, so we got about fifteen okay. more minutes, you know, to, okay. to give it all to I'll hit a home run. Yeah. So anyway, um, I'm having a blast back in the kitchen. So Johnny Gallen, my mentor, ends up in 148 as a lieutenant working mm -hmm. with, with Captain Gallo. So at the time, I speak to Captain Gallagher as a spot, and he goes, no problem, you'll be my guy, I know you since you're a probie, this, that, whatever. So what happens, going back with Johnny, when we used to run into Borough Park, one of the guys, Greg Forsythe, who was a legendary Harlem guy, and came down to us in 114, he used to lean off the side of the tower ladder and yell, Oi, vey, get out of the way, Oi, vey, get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so <laughs> You know, after a while, some, <laughs> some of the local Borough Park people would come up, and the kids were fascinated with the rig. So one of the guys used to say to our old captain, Begley, 
hey, uh, a, 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 uh, could you turn on the Viggle Vaggles for the kids? He goes, the Viggle Vaggles? You know, the Viggle Vaggles, the things on the roof. The, 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 oh, the, the Viggle Vaggles. The Viggle Vaggles. <laughs> the Viggle Vaggles. So one day we're on beat them. And, <laughs> and we're, uh, we're inspecting one of their buildings. And this, this Jewish guy tells me, he's not letting me in. Go fuck myself. So, it, it, you know, he had the Yiddish accent and whatever. He's like, go fuck yourself. So Patty McAvoy, <laughs> a legendary captain for 174, he was a long time covering boss in our place. And he comes, so we go back to tell him. He goes, what did you fucking say? So he comes up with the summons book and we, he lights the guy up. He goes, you cursed out my guy, this and that. And the, the place was a shit show. And, and so he gave him a bunch of VOs and he's like, is it going to cost money? He goes, oh yeah, lots of money. And the guy was freaking out. So the next day, we're at a really good job in Burlington. His name wasn't Milner, was it? By <laughs> <any chance? laughs> so, so the next day, we're, right. at a, we're at So the guy, you know, he, the guys were tormenting me. This guy told you to go fuck yourself. You didn't do anything about it. So with that, we go to a banging job the next day in Borough Park. And at the end of the job, it's a hot summer day. <clears> and we're up, I'm helping the engine. And all of a sudden, like these 10 little rabbinical students come up to me. They're about nine years old. And they're wearing, you know, the uniform, the hat, the whole bit. And they go, excuse me, uh, are you Jorgensen? And I'm going, and I'm saying, well, maybe they saw my name on the back of my coat. I go, yeah, I'm Jorgensen. How can I help you? How could you help us? Go fuck yourself. Then, <laughs> <laughs> Your name's out there in the Yiddish books. <laughs> and there's Johnny Garland sitting on the front floor. For a oh, he's just years. telling everybody. Uh, yeah, I, got stop there, I got you. He's so telling everybody. Johnny is now a lieutenant 148. I put in, but in the interim, him and Gala have a falling out. So when the order is supposed to drop, I call Captain Gala. He goes, listen, I kind of had a change of heart. And I says, Cap, I said, I, I get it. I said, you and Johnny, I said, don't worry about it. No hard feelings. I'll pull my paper. So in the interim, Chief Spellman from the 37, um, he was my, my best buddy, Johnny Shot from 201 Engine. And Johnny was just this super, super guy. And the Duke, John McGuire, was trying to recruit Johnny up the street for years, and Johnny just wouldn't leave. And the heartbreak of that is Johnny's wife was pregnant on 9-11, and so was my wife. And um, I came home after four days, and my wife told me, you know, we're going to have another baby. And I said, well, yeah, that's good news, but Johnny's wife is having a baby, too, and he's dead. And in May of 02, <clears throat> his first son was born, and my little beautiful Catherine was born three days apart. So a lot of guilt again in that area. So so I Chief Spellman knew my my friendship with John and he loved John. John was just the go to guy on the back step to keep everything in order. So Chief Spells goes, listen, Joggy, um, we're having a couple of growing pains. We're, we're, you know, 112 is in with 222 and I need a guy who's not scared to be a boss. And I said, Chief, you know, you shouldn't have a hard time getting a the guy there. They're doing some banging fire duty. And he goes, look. I want my guy. And he goes, you're my guy. Put in your paper. So I said, all right, chief. And I thought he was just being nice over a couple of beers at a golf outing. He calls me up a few days later. He's like, where the fuck's your paper? I says, chief, I thought you were just being nice. He goes, I'm never nice. You want the spider? <laughs> oh, oh, shoot. So I end up in 120. And great place, great guys. But we had some issues. A couple guys, one guy I went to high school with. My first day in the cab, he's driving me and tells me to my face, He's going to do nothing but make my life miserable because he's a boss fighter. And I go, bro, I don't remember taking your lunch money in high school. What, what, what the fuck did I do to you? He said, nothing, but it's on. And I said, okay, well, thanks. Uh, I guess that means welcome. <laughs> so, so you know what? You're going to take some guys there who are going to think I'm the biggest scumbag there was. And you're going to take some guys to say, no, he was a good guy who did the right thing. I, I, I stuck my chest out for my men. I don't remember that. And I remember seeing you, you know, you still, we used to work. I, I worked in 112 quite a bit uh, back then too. I don't remember yeah, any of that I, really. I tried to keep it under wraps, but I'll put it to you this way, Lou. There's no hard feelings. It's a great place. I still have guys that I love from there, but there was a couple guys that were bullies and I out bullied them. I, I took a couple guys down a basement. I can proudly say and I said, let's go. Everyone land a punch on my jaw, but the one coming back is going to break yours. Let's do it. And they didn't stand up to the fight. And I said, in Valley Ho, we call you a coward. And I walked out. So certain guys would say scumbag. But this is what the Duke told me, Captain John McGuire, when I would drive him. I love that man. Love him to death. 
He said, if you're a boss, because I was up for the show, I was getting promoted. He said, if the scumbags hate you, you're doing your job. But if the good guys know you're a good guy, you're still doing your job. And that's how I rolled. So there's certain guys that might say, good guy. I had a lot to say, but only when it was standing was, up for what was right. Was Karatu there? Or he was out of there, Mike? Karatu, one of the sweetest, legendary gentlemen that the fight. He's one of my favorite guys. The guy, Lou. A character we can do a podcast on Ron character. Oh no, I know. Legend, <laughs> legend. my son. Where's his bike? Did you find his bike yet? His bike he... is still missing. And my son. 1955. Schwinn. On Karatu and got an A triple plus. The teacher was so blown away by Captain Karatu. No, I love that. He was a sweetheart. This is the sad part about it. You lose touch when you're out. Um, I, I've been out of the job going on ten years. Um, and I've lost touch with a lot of guys, and this is almost helping me realize I need to catch back up. So, flash forward, I did my time in 112. Um, we moved back to Knickerbocker, and I was, let's just say, living in my summer home at the time, and it was 85 miles each way and two tolls, and it took me five and a half hours to get home one night, and I said, I'm tired, I need a break. My family needs me to be there for them because I was working three jobs and I was never, ever, ever home. And my wife, who's again, the daughter of a fireman, <clears throat> an extremely patient woman. You know, we're married 30 years next week and she should have thrown me to the curb a lot of times and she never did. So that, that day and that, I went out to 80 and some, it was like a reunion. My buddy from 105 Truck, Tommy Wolgen, was my chauffeur. And I was working with some great guys that came from some great companies. And life was just cruising along. And there was no hard feelings. I left 112. I used to bat heads with 111, and I'll never forget this. And we, we parted ways, and I, I ran into Eric Wiener as he was on his last week of the job. And Eric, as you know, is a legend and a class act. And we would bat heads sometimes. But when Marty Simmons, God rest him, had passed away, and unbeknownst to anyone, Marty was very, very sick. And he, tr he rescued his son in Lake Tahoe, but drowned in the process. And during the project I'm involved in now, I, I came across Marty's wife and she explained to me what all had happened. And I helped run Marty's funeral with the ceremony team. I was a proud member of the ceremony unit, which we started right after 9-11. And Eric said to me, he goes, you know what, Lou? We might have had our moments, but you, you helped run that funeral like he was one of your guys. And I pointed to my patch and I said, Eric, he was, he was a New York city fireman like me and you. And he, and we hugged. I said, I love you brother. And God bless you and retire well and enjoy. And a week later, we're at a pin job again, strange enough. Pin job. And I come back and the fire department calls me and said, you're relieved of duty. Your bloods have crashed. You cannot ride. You will bleed to death if you get a cut. And I went, what the F? And a whole blur of my life started that moment. And I looked at Tommy Wolgin, my friend, and Tommy, God bless him, did a mutual with Dennis Oberg Jr. that morning in 105 and will never forgive himself. And I said, Tommy, you're now the acting lieutenant. I'm very sick. My career is over and I think my life's over. And I called, I, I battalion, I called battalion and they, they were the ones who told me I was relieved. I said, okay, Tommy's now acting lieutenant. I'm going to move another guy up to the wheel, and I'm going home. And the kicker was it was a Friday morning at 9 o'clock, and the medical office wouldn't see me on a field visit because they all want to duck out early on Friday. And I spent the whole weekend panicking because I had only my platelet count, which was really bad. And the platelets is your, your clotter, but platelets also indicates you have leukemia. <laughs> And a couple of medical people in my family said, this is really bad, why don't you go to the hospital? And I said, no, they told me to come in Monday, I'll come in Monday. And I won't use names because I don't believe in doing that, but one of the doctors, uh, highly placed, was my doctor on the outside. And when I first got to medical, one of the guys who's known as a career douchebag, who's basically wants to put guys back immediately, tilted his hands back like this and went, looked at my bloods and went, whoa, Lieutenant, busy summer. Now my spleen was out like a football at the time. And I was in a bed. I knew something was wrong for a long time. And I went, excuse me? I said, are you judging me? 
can you give me an exam? And he goes, whoa, bro, you're mistaking me for your doctor. He goes, I'm here for your duty status. You're riding a desk tomorrow. You've been on light. You've been on medical for 72 hours. And I lost my mind. I said, are you Dude, fucking kidding me? Kidding I said, me? <laughs> I almost 22 years with the firm. I said, I went back with a fractured back in 30 days, and you're trying to tell me I'm a malingerer? And I screamed at the guy. I want to kill that guy. <laughs> oh, I almost did, Lou. And, I want to kill that guy. He had to walk in, right? And, and I knew him. And he goes, what's going on? And another doctor walked in. And I handed them the paperwork. I went this. And the other doctor went, ooh, okay. Who's your doctor? And I went, doctor, blah, blah, blah. She goes, okay, go see them tomorrow. I said, I will. Well, I did. And immediately, because I, I can say without sin, I went to the counseling unit early on because I lost my best friend right here. I lost a lot of guys I loved. And I wasn't embarrassed to say I needed to talk about it. But the, the dirty, rotten secret is when you have that C on your medical folder with BHS, you're marked. So when I went to see this doctor, the first thing she says is, how is the drinking? I said, ma'am, the drinking's not an issue. I said, Could you? I, she goes, well, I said, please don't stereotype me. Something's really wrong. I've been telling you for a couple of years that I don't feel well. Well, go down to Staten Island Cancer Institute, this, this, and this. And she goes, and we'll figure it out. Well, three weeks later, I went for a sonogram the next day. Someone at the regional radiology said, why aren't you in the hospital? This was two weeks later. I said, well, what do you mean? They're like, we sent this for priority transmittal to your doctor. You're supposed to be hospitalized. So this was July 14th of 2011. Now fast forward to August 3rd. I show up to BHS, and I'm sorry. I hope I don't get you guys any problems out of this, right? I'm not. No, no. I'm this is this story. is your experience, bro. I'm just saying what happened. This, this is this is right here from God. This is what happens. So I'm waiting for the doctor, and I have a 12 noon appointment, and I get there at 11:40, and the guy at the desk says, "Lou, I'm uh, <laughs> sorry, but they're gone for the day." And I go, "Uh oh." So I call the XO. And I said, dude, uh, I'm supposed to see Dr. So-and-so. And he goes, oh, oh, we're at lunch. I said, yeah, but are you coming back? No. I said, well, you need to come back. I'm dying. So in the meantime, there's one guy down there, Jimmy, who's a great nurse, the guy with glasses. He's been there for I know the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's good. Brother. Jimmy, brother. He's always brother. 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 Jimmy, brother. brother. I love you, Jimmy, still. Like, you saved my life. He sees me sitting in a chair two and a half hours <laughs> later. He goes, oh, and I... I you look familiar. I said, yeah, Jimmy, I'm Nils. How you doing? Yeah, yeah. How's it going? I said, can you look at this? He goes, oh, shit. Well, what do you he, he thought I was drunk because I, I, as you can see, I get very red. I have leukemia, right? I now know. He goes, what's going on today? I hand him the, the jacket. He goes, oh, oh, shit. He takes my blood pressure. It's 240 over 140. Oh, so shit. one of the good doctors, he takes it again. One of the good doctors, he waves him in. He takes it. Now it's 240 over 160. He goes, okay, so what's going on? I tell him real fast. He says to Jimmy, code him. He's, he's circling. Make sure they send ALS, which we know as paramedics. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, three buses show up because it's like fireman, cop, medic down. We, we come out in force, right? So now I'm laying on the floor, fucking fading, and I got oxygen on. And this six-foot-eight tall paramedic, African-American guy who I knew from the streets, he goes, oh, 114, I haven't seen you in a long time, bro. I said, yeah, doc. And I was in the army. We called it the docs, uh, the medics doc. I said, yeah, I went down the other side of Brooklyn. Now I'm out in Staten Island. And what do you got today? I hand him the paperwork. He goes, whoa, how come we're not in the hospital? And I went, doc, I don't know. In struts this doctor, and they get into a fight over what's wrong with me. And I get into a fight with what's wrong with me. So he overrides them and races me to Brooklyn Methodist. So I'll speed this up because I know we're running out of time. So anyway, they drill into my hip. This little lady gets up on top of me and it looked like an old fucking drill from the 1800s. And they take him bone marrow because the doctor said you should have been here a month ago. They pull out the marrow. They send it out. And two days later, they come back in and they say, look, you've got a really rare, really advanced leukemia. We can treat it only one way. I said, okay, what do we have to do? They say, you're going to probably pray to die. we got to give you two and a half years of chemo in seven days. I said, well, what's my options? They said, there are none. Okay. So they can't, the drug is so rare, they have to find it. It's in Cleveland Clinic. they got to fly it in, this, that, whatever. 
So it takes a few days by the time they get it and they start the treatment. So in walks this particular. Are you in the hospital the whole time, Neil? Oh, never left. Never left. Okay. Dude. And did 26 straight days in that one and then another five in another. But anyway, so in on the third day, the commissioner came in and wanted to know if the doctor was there yet. Because there was a big shit show in, in BHS when I went down. Everybody who was anyone showed up to see. Because I'm flopping around like a flounder fucking dying on the second floor. So I said, they, ha they haven't been here yet. He said, oh, sh they'll be here. I said, don't even bother at this point, Commissioner. I have doctors who know what they're doing. So one of the, uh, the legendary ponytail doctors that we love, he comes in on the third day wanting to know why I'm occupying a cancer bed for a panic attack and alcohol abuse. Oh. That, that was what went down on, on the, the report, the field report, right? So I rip into him, and one of the drivers was a guy from Coney Island, Vinny, who was a, just a gentleman. And he actually worked in the hospital in, in, you know, in engineering, and he used to make sure I had enough AC in my room and a fan. I love this guy, and I forget his last name, but he took such fucking good care of me. And he, he stood behind a doctor, and he gave me the thumbs up, like, go for it. And I said, excuse me, doc, do you have any idea what's wrong with me? Oh, no. I, I, I said, could you look at my folder? And he looked and he goes, oh, 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 oh. I said, now do me a favor. Just get the F out of here. No, those guys are, most of those guys aren't yeah. real. I mean, they're yeah. nothing. Well, my real, then my, my, my doctor, supposedly, allegedly, comes in on two weeks. <clears throat> now, mind you, they start the IV. It's a bag this big, right? It never stops for seven and a half days. The guy says to me, I got to put on a hazmat suit. It's so caustic that if it spills on me, you, or anything, it'll burn. <laughs> but we're going to stick this you, inside you. We're going to put it inside <laughs> you. That's what I said. Right. Don't worry about it. Mike Nunez is my, my idol, my angel, my lifesaver, right? And this other lady, Alta Gracia, they were my two primary nurses. So anyway, he explains to me, he goes, it'll burn from the inside out, but that's what it's designed to do. So as he preps the IV, it spills on a tube, and the tube starts to smoke. And I panic. I, feel, I go, Mike, you're not putting that in my body. And through the hazmat mask, he goes, Nels, if I don't, you're dead. You got about 48 hours. I went, okay, bro, wow. let's do this. Well, guess what happens? After being in there for two weeks, and now I'm on the, the seventh of eight days on the IV, in walks this doctor. And she says to me, so what is it that's wrong with you today, Lieutenant? And I'm thinking this is an episode from the fuck. What is pilot. going on? What? But Louie, I'm thinking, I'm thinking one of my guys is standing behind a curtain setting this up as a joke. Right, it's right. No right. Joke. It's you, no joke. She's dead. dead. Serious. She's dead serious. But here's the kicker. A year prior to that, I had a moment with a chief who's a friend. He gave a 1019 for a structure fire. They were about to close our engine down. We got into it. I lost. He's a chief. I'm a lieutenant. I ended up in bad lieutenant camp for six months. During that six months, they gave me a medical. Guess what? I had cancer then. But you know what the cruel kicker is? I never got the paperwork because I wasn't in my command. It never got to oh me. Oh, my That's God. Lawsuit. Lawsuit. <laughs> right? But listen to this. <clears throat> to this hospital, one of the guys down in the in, in medical office found it and brought it to me by hand and said, bro, you need to get this to someone. And now I'm going... Mother of mercy, I, I was I had this a fucking year ago. So when this Holy lady says shit. So what is it that's wrong with you? I said, ma'am, you have no idea. Uh, uh well, you, you you probably have alcoholism and PTSD. I said, really? Look at the chart, please. And she goes, uh, I said, Yeah, it's an incurable leukemia. I have a 50-50 chance of getting out of here, and they're <laughs> nuking the living shit out of me to try to save me. She goes, I'm sorry to hear that. And I went. So am I. Now do me a favor. Get the bleep out of here. You're fired. Excuse me, Lieutenant. I said, ma'am, I've lost my hearing. I've lost my vision and I've lost my mind from this chemo. It's so vicious. Please leave now. So now the games begin. So now I'm getting calls from so-and-so and so-and-so that if you, if, you, if you sue the doctors, no one gets three quarters and they'll throw bricks through your window because you know how it works. I said, yeah, I know how it works. So I, I called up the union and I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I said, I want a department oncologist because if we don't get one, I'm going down to Washington in my uniform and I'm going to stir it up just like John Feel. And I said, you fucks almost killed me. Well, I get a <coughs> phone call a month later that said, 
hey, Luke, thank you. We now have a department oncologist. But in the interim, I got threats that I was going to be fired for living in New Jersey, that I was going to lose my pension, my 23 and a half years of service. And I said, guys, I'm a dead man anyway. Bring it, bring it, bring it. And it really, so I went out of the job in, in a somewhat bad way with some people. And it's okay because it's given me now fire and courage. You know, I was lost for the last 10 years trying to search out a purpose of how do I help people again? Because I'm one of those assholes. When I was a probie, I went to Captain Narbert and I says, Cap, can I hand in my vacation? I don't want to leave because I had a little bit, you know, my seniority with the cops. I had two years, uh, two weeks of vacation the first year. He goes, kid, do me a favor. Get the frig out of here. I'll see you in two weeks. I would have, if you said to me today, I could go back on that truck tomorrow, drop 40 pounds, whatever it is. Guys, I would race to the firehouse. I mean it, you know. And, and I miss it with my soul. But now what it's done is I held on to a lot of anger and a lot of rage and a lot of huge emotions for a really long time. And I reached out a few years back and I wrote a letter to someone who does the most for cancer research out of anyone in history. And it was this this man named David <laughs> Koch. He's one of the Koch brothers from those big time industries that they run. And they were, they were ripping the shit out of him one day in, in the press about something stupid. And I wrote a handwritten letter to him. And I got a call back a few weeks later from his secretary, who his press agent, who used to work for Mayor Giuliani, Christine Ledigano. And she said, he'd like to talk to you. I get on the phone. I'm like, this guy wants to talk to me. And he said, uh, you wrote a letter. He goes, by the way, very good penmanship. I said, oh, thank mm. you, sir. And I learned from Captain Caratu. Captain Caratu had the best, best penmanship in the world, right? <laughs> and, and I said, he goes, why would you reach out? I said, sir, you gave me the gift of a second chance. I said, you donate $150 million to Sloan Kettering. And I said, my doctor, who's keeping me alive right now, studied under one of your research grants. I said, I owe you everything. He says, you owe me nothing. He invited me up to a ribbon cutting for the new wing and I went and I met him and I met his wife and, and they were just the nicest people. I felt like I was hanging out with my dad mm. and I actually got to sit down next to Larry Kudlow, uh, who's, you know, the big time economist. And, yep. and it was hysterical. He knocked a glass across over my table and I uh, opened up my plate and he goes, nice to meet you, chief. I said, well, I appreciate the field promotion, sir. I'm a lieutenant, but uh, great to meet you. He was a character. Anyway, Mr. Coke winds up passing away from cancer. And someone from his family wanted me to uh, be interviewed on a podcast as to why I reached out. So it was called The Gift of a Second Chance. And then the folks who did this, the gentleman who put it together, he wanted to do a charity podcast series to commemorate 9-11 as a tribute because we feel that it's being forgotten. And these brave, great souls that have basically given everything are now fading away. And believe it or not, in 26 states in the United States, there's no curriculum to teach 9-11. It's actually considered offensive in hundreds of school districts. So, so part of the mission is to restore that, that unity, as we all know, existed on 9-12-01, right? When people were lined up along the West Side Highway yep. to say they loved us and to say we were heroes and to say cops and firemen and medics and nurses were the greatest people ever. And, of course, politicians were just jumping in to get a picture and a hashtag, never yeah, forget, yeah, yeah. hashtag, we love you. And so, so we're just trying to restore some of that dignity and respect. So I, I'm involved in this charity podcast called 20 for 20 Podcast, and we're halfway Petey, through. we got that uh, web uh, thing, don't we, somewhere? I do, right yeah, here. Yeah, so, Niels, just uh, somebody, I don't know if somebody reached out to me initially. I don't know how yeah. we... It's been a while, well, but somebody I touched wanna, base with me. I didn't me. want to bother you guys because, you know, I, I felt like you guys have your platform and stuff. And then, and then you know, like the producer running it who's putting it together, he says, no, he goes, these are great guys. And I knew your show. I'm a fan. I said, nah, but I said, it's like asking a friend for a favor. I never want to do nah, No, you know? no, 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 and, no, no. And then, but I realized, I said, but you know what? The, the focus of our listenership is guys like us, people who love – you know, first responders, cops, firemen, military. And, and I realized, I said, you know what? These probably would be the perfect guys because we don't have a budget. We don't have sponsors. We don't have um, 
you know, anyone really backing us because it's a charitable grassroots mm -hmm. campaign. Um, you know, we have this gentleman who is a, is a wonderful, wonderful human being. He owns the uh, Arizona Diamondbacks. And, you know, as we know, they whooped our ass in 2001 against the Yankees. But, but you know, he's such a wonderful man, Ken Kendrick. And he literally took his team. They flew through the night and he said to his team, we're not going to the hotel to sleep. We're going down to the World Trade Center. And he took two busloads of guys and they went on a viewing platform, you know, in mid-October 01, in the height of everything. And they witnessed our guys processing a body that had just been found. And he said it made a life lasting impression on him. And he actually put in the, in the rings, in the World Series rings, never forget 9-11-01. Hmm. And when I met him, he wanted to be a sponsor of this project to get the word out. And I said, sir, I'm so honored and touched that you thought that much of our guys and our city. He said, don't you understand? He said, you guys... Your guys who went there, they were heroes to the world. And you know what's really got me kind of burned up is it, taking politics out of it, right? I mean, we got a bunch of stuff that's happened in the last few years. And look, America's not perfect, but we're the best damn country in the world. And every responder and every military person is not perfect, but they're willing to give up every one of their yep. tomorrows so someone had there today. So one of my really dear friends is a guy, Robert John Burke, He's a famous actor. I lovingly know him as Bobby. And, and I had the blessing of working. Um, I drove the fire truck on the show, Rescue Me. And, you know, I took some heat from it because some of the show didn't make us look so great. But I used to say to people, hey, guys, we don't make ourselves look great. I mean, you know, and Dennis Leary, God bless him, is a huge, huge fan of what we do. And the man has donated millions and millions of yeah. dollars to help fire departments. Listen, Nils, in the end, you can't please everybody, bro. You know what I'm Louis saying? You know that. Yes, yes. You can't please everybody. That. You know, Lieutenant William Thomas Marjorie taught me that. And you know, the sad part about it is I was going to reach out to him in August to thank him. And he passed away of COVID. And my heart was broken. Actually, uh, Mikey McVeigh just actually sent me that picture. I was going to send it to Pete, but there he is that's, right yeah. there. Yeah, that's that's the boss, man. And you know what? I loved him. He He's one of my fathers, right? And I don't need an alternate father because I have a stellar one. But he was one of those men when I wasn't with my dad, I was with my dad. Mm. And I'll never forget it. Boss Marjorie was a tough guy. And his last night on the job, he was in 217 on overtime. And I was I was in 112. And one of the guys from 111, I was asked to go in to overhaul a room. And this isn't a knock to 111. I have a lot of respect for them. And I asked the guy nicely. I said, hey, bro, I got to come in here and overhaul. And he goes, yeah, good luck. And he blocked the doorway. I tapped him again. I said, bro, listen, do me a favor. I just got to come in here and do my job. Could you step aside? He goes, go for it. I tap him one more time. I said, bro, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you, get the fuck out of my way. He goes, go fuck yourself. And he butters himself into the doorway. Well, I'm 300 pounds. And back then I was working out a lot. I flew this guy across the fucking room with a brown <laughs> like a <laughs> But the, the kicker was he wound he up picked that. I mean, who's telling you to not come in? I don't over. get it. He fucking deserved it, right? But the, the kicker is he almost tumbled out of the brownstone window. And thank God he caught him. <laughs> and that kind of sends me down. I love it. So the lieutenant comes storming after me. His lieutenant. I go, bro. Are you fucking kidding me? I said, if one of my guys said that to you, his face would be spinning around like Daffy Duck on Bugs Bunny. I says, be a fucking lieutenant. Well, Bill Marjorie calls me up. He was there. He saw it happen. I didn't know this. Now, Bill, two weeks before that, I saw him up the rock. And he, he yells over, kid. And I, I'm looking around. I know the voice. And I come storming down the hallway in the rock. And there he is. And he jumps out and grabs me. I wrote him a letter. When I got made, I said, hey, boss, I'm sorry I let you down. I would have proudly been that guy, Doc Holliday, right next to you, Wyatt Earp. <laughs> and I'm so sorry that I betrayed you. And he went, kid, you never betrayed me. I trained you right, and you learned right, and you lead your men right. I'm proud of you. I love you. And he hugged me. Now, Mudman would never admit to this if he was still alive, but he did it. So a week later, after I almost flew that guy out the fucking window, who fucking deserved it, okay, uh... he, calls me up. he calls me up and he goes like, this. Kid, this is Bill. I go, Lou. He goes, no, I'm Bill. I said, Lou, 
He goes, tell me what happened. I am so disappointed in you. Now I'm thinking, oh my God, I let my father down. Tell me exactly what happened. I told him, he goes, kid, I'm really disappointed now. I said, boss, I'm so sorry. You taught me right. He goes, no, the next time a guy like that. Knock him out. <laughs> you break his fucking jaw. You said to the dentist. I that. And I go, boss, I love you. Catch all the fish that God put in the ocean because the mud man loved to fish. And I so badly wanted to reach out in August. And one of the guys from 105, strange enough, was my friend Hugh, who you know, Coops, who was in for his second cancer surgery in Sloan. And Mike, his nurse, is a 105 guy. And I subsequently drove Huey back to Phoenix after that to get him back. He's a veterinarian now, this bad scientist, to get him back home to Phoenix with his pickup and his dog. Mm. And I called up and his nurse called me up and says, how you doing, bro? I'm giving you the update. I'm a 105 guy. And I said, holy shit, Mike. First of all, how's Huey? He's good. He's good. Blah, blah. I said, how is my, my mentor, my legendary Lieutenant William Thomas Mudry? And I heard the fucking pause and he said, I'm mm. sorry to tell you this. And I went, motherfucker. And I knew he was dead. And it crushed me. It killed me. Because I found out two weeks before that, my foxhole buddy from Army Basic Training, I was just about to drive up the road to Kentucky to track him down. And he was a cop and he died. And I'm not letting it happen to a third person that I love. So now I call all of these guys that I mm. love and admire and worship. I don't want to end up bellicose and sad and depressive. But guys, it's so temporary. Ricky Tan and Greta, who was one of the loves of my life in 105 such a kind huge big guy ricky was a rescue three guy and a rescue five guy oh i know him i know ricky him. Passed right. away, yeah. ricky passed away recently yeah 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 and all of these legendary great guys that were so kind to me and so good to me and they're dying so that's why i'm on this mission with this podcast yeah and so the, so nils tell us uh, so yeah. how far are you halfway through it now we're halfway through it. We just finished up. We just interviewed Ray Pfeiffer's wife, Mrs. Pfeiffer, Karen. And Ray, as you guys know, what a what a lion, what a supreme gentleman who is protecting thousands of us. You know, Lou, when I got out of the hospital, I was being sued for $125,000, almost $150,000 because no one wanted to pay my bill back then. Because back in 11, leukemia wasn't considered 9-11. Right, like, right, right. What's off the graph. And, and a guy who was in my room helping my family out, he's now since dead from multiple myeloma. And I won't oh give him names because of family. And I'll never forget this. You know what my kids said was the two best things about me getting cancer? One was dad was home. Daddy's home a lot now. And two, Mr. Brennan makes us the best chicken fingers in the world. My buddy, one of my, one of my young trainees from Ladder 80, who's now a 42 truck member, Kevin Brennan. And Kev, if you're listening, I love you. My kids to this day still talk about those chicken fingers you used to send every day. <laughs> I, I love chicken fingers. I talked to Kevin oh, a little bit. Me too, bro. He said, bring them up to 42. I'll cook them. And nice. this is the strangest thing. My, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter is now a nurse because of the nurses I had. But they still remember those chicken fingers, and they remember Tommy Moore driving them to the cancer hospital and picking up my wife and and the guys, the guys from 80, the guys from 114, uh, 112, from 15, 82, all these guys. You know, I was lucky enough, you know, when you stay in one place for, for your whole career, that's a great thing. But I bounced around a lot, and some of it was by, by circumstance and some of it was by choice. But I got to know a lot of guys, and, and, and I say this to people. I know the best people that are, are in America. I've worked with them. I've gotten to know them. I've drank beer with them. And, you know, one of my good buddies, who's a big fan, Jeff Richards, he's a fireman from North Hudson Fire Department in Jersey. And Jeff is fighting a good fight right now, and he's retired. So, Jeff, keep going, my brother. And so many great, great guys that have been there for me and been there for my family. And, and you know, I, I can't name them because there's just too many of them. And all I could say to people is how blessed were we to, to walk amongst giants and get paid for it? Mm. You know, I used to say to my wife, I can't friggin' believe they pay me to do They pay it. us to do this job, right? It's really not even work. Right. <laughs> yeah. And Dennis, Dennis is a character. He used to go, yeah, we're the pussies that are pretending to be you guys, right? And, and, like, and on Rescue Me. And it's so true. Like, the guys on Rescue Me, we used to laugh and say, wait a minute. So they're paying us to pretend who we really are when we leave here and go, go to the <laughs> quiet. 
<laughs> and, and one of my buddies, one of my buddies, I won't say his name because I don't want to get him jammed up, but he's a state trooper in New Jersey, right? Great guy. And he he was so into it. And he's friendly with, with a with a dispatcher buddy of ours, Johnny Burke, who worked with us on the show. And Kevin, Kevin just loved what we did. And he said, Hey, you mind if I work with you guys? I said, Yeah, we'll get you gear. And the guys in his squad used to bust his balls. And then all of a sudden he goes, guys, they need like a hundred guys for this big scene. Six guys literally dove at him to come work. Jersey State Troopers come work as New York Fireman. And we hammered the shit out of them that day. It was great. I mean, they loved it. We treated them like gold. And and because I realized, you know, I live in Tennessee now. People love the FDNY. And I said, oh, yeah, man. make a good impression. Because if, if they only meet an FDNY guy once in their whole life, they're going to walk away going either that guy, they're great guys, or they suck. Okay. And I've always wanted to make sure that they thought we were great guys. Hmm. Nils, what uh, what day is this? I didn't want to get off too much, too far off. How, what what day is this on? This uh, twenty for twenty? Is it on YouTube? Is it on it's, uh, it's what's on, it on? It's it's on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and then mm -hmm. you can actually go to the website directly at twenty four twenty podcast dot com, and you'll see the Iron Light Labs as the sponsor, and you can actually click directly on to the website. Can you watch it live, and, or it's um, after? Well, what it is, it's only a it's only an <laughs> audio cast. And we, we release a new one every Thursday morning. Um, and it's so it's only audio. We didn't we didn't really have the budget and everything else to go video and whatnot. So but it's it's well done. The guys who are putting it together are professionals. And the people at Iron Light are they're all donating their time and, and their money and their efforts to put this together because they truly believe that it's being forgotten and they don't want that to happen. So well, yeah, and then if you can get some traction. Yeah, and you know we 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 have we, right now we have a small loyal a uh, loyal listenership, but the kicker is the fact that we don't have a big budget. It, it, it's kind of keeping us stuck in the mud a little bit, right? Because it's hard to reach people. Um, but oh, I know. And and, 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 <laughs> and I'm, I'm, right, you guys, you know, you have a loyal, loyal, thick base, and and I'm and I really mean this to say this, right? And I am so honored to be involved with it because. I'm getting a chance to to talk about the greatest people that I ever got the chance to meet. And some of them I didn't get to meet personally. And and Bobby Burke from, from Rescue Me, I'm, I'm going to veer back because I lost it for a second. Bobby, the actor, is actually a participator in it. He gives the, out, the outro on every episode. And Bobby's going to be a featured episode speaking about Captain Patty Brown, who was his best friend, and Father Michael Judge, who was one of his best friends. So Bobby has a very direct connection, and he dedicated his life now as a volunteer fireman out in Fire Island. Now, Bobby That's doesn't cool. need that. He's a busy, busy guy, right, working movies, TV shows, commercials. And he'll get up at 2 o'clock in the morning for an old lady having a stroke to get her on a helicopter to fly her over to Long Island for, for treatment. I mean, he's just that kind of guy. And I was in New Orleans with him. Um, we were down there to help rebuild the firehouses. Um, Dennis Leary, through his foundation, sponsored the rebuild. And Bobby and this lovely actress, Callie Thorne, from the show, um, and Bobby's son, and a bunch of us from the show who worked on it, all FDMY guys, we went down a few times to help rebuild New Orleans fire. And one of my best friends in my life I met was retired New Orleans Captain Chuck Brockmeyer, who was uh, an airborne ranger in Vietnam used to rescue down pilots and Chuck has since passed from cancer. And Chuck used to call me up every single morning when I was in the hospital fighting for my life. And he'd say, my brother, you get down in your foxhole, you keep your head down till this blows over, you will make it. And the cruel irony is Chuck died a few days before the election in 2016. And my last conversation with him is, fear not my brother, God is good. There are a lot of good Americans in this country and we will not falter. And no. Chuck, I miss you, and I miss Johnny Shart, and I miss Bill Mudry, and so many great, great human beings that came into my life in a positive way. So I'm blessed, guys. I uh, well, Nils, I say all the time, and when I, especially when I talk to the, I say the show's about you, but in the end, it's really not about you, right? As you can tell, like the people that you that you talk about, the people that mean the most to you. You know the stories and the pride that you have in those people. That's yeah, what shows through. All the people that touch your life. That right. You, that's that's yeah, what shows through in the in the one, show. 
One of my dearest friends is a guy, Tony Samowitz. Tony was one of those guys who showed up down a 15 truck with a bag and said, where do you need me? And I got him over to 112 and he was my chauffeur. And I call him Maverick and he called me Goose. And he mm -hmm. looked in the cab at me one day after we, we had a really great 1075 and he did his usual fucking awesome job. And he went, hey boss, it's all about the guy right next to you and nothing else really matters. And I said, Mav, you're so right, my brother. Mm. It's just the sad <laughs> part about it is so many Americans don't get that concept, right? Yeah. Good I mean, recovery, if, you, if you said to me, wind sprint from Tennessee, which I don't know if I could do that, get back, you're working the nine by tomorrow, hand uh -huh. back every yeah. penny he's given you in your pension and this and that, I swear to God I would do it. I miss it so much. Yeah. And I would give I would give anything to be back on that truck. You know, we used to call the 114 the Shamrock Battleship. And I'd get on the loudspeaker every tour and I'd say, men, there's six men in the entire universe that get the privilege to ride aboard the Shamrock battleship tonight. You're one of the lucky few. Consider it an honor. And they'd be hey, like, who? oh, you joggy, you scumbag. But, mm -hmm. but they knew it. They felt the same yeah. way. It was, hey, it was my lightning in the bottle. And I, I wish I could recapture it, but it's gone. It's gone now. But you know what? No, I it's not. It's and still there, bro. I'm it's still 10 years of remission this Thanksgiving. And wow. I'm really hoping Good to be you, man. 10 years from now to celebrate 20. Yeah. Good for you, I, uh, man. And you know what? What breaks my heart is Larry Sullivan from Rescue 5 was a friend of mine. Yeah. Right? Big Larry, right? I ran into Larry in the medical office in October of 11. And he said, Nels, what are you doing here, bro? And I hadn't seen Larry in a little while. And I said, ah, Larry, I got cancer. He says, yeah, me too. But he goes, he gives me a hug. He says, but we're too big mix and we're going to beat this. <laughs> and I yeah. said, I, well, I know, Larry, we got this. And now nine months later, I'm standing at his funeral. And and it didn't take much to lift Larry because he lost. No, him. he lost a I ton of weight, man. Say, he was big, a big Larry. At the, he looked Larry terrible. was a big bear of a sweetheart. And I stood there quivering, trying to render the proper salute mm -hmm. that I brought in the army. And I couldn't keep my hand from shaking because I said to myself, God, why this great guy and why not me? A lot and of I cancer, spent man. A lot of, time a lot of doing cancer. That. And now I say, because you got something in store for me. You know, my beautiful Irish mother in law came to me in the height of that chemo in a, in a vision. And she used to call me her boyfriend. She was such a great mother in law. I know most guys, you know, have issues, but not me. I loved her. And she used to call me a boyfriend. We'd sit and talk forever. And she said, and I said, Nan, please take me. I want to go home. I'm ready. I'm done. She goes, No, my boyfriend. He's not ready. He's not ready. Go back. Take care of Annie and the kids. And when he's ready, he's going to come for you. And, and she faded away. And I'm crying. Please, Nan, please bring me back. And, and my doctor, at one of my doctors at the time was an atheist. And she sent in a shrink because she thought I was, I was losing my mind a little bit with the chemo. So in walks this shrink who's also a rabbi from Borough Park. And he remembered 114 and whatever. So he says, Nels, tell me about what's going on. So I said, okay, doc, I told him the whole story and he starts giggling. He goes, I believe you. He said, you and I, we work for the same corporation called God. We just mm -hmm. work different departments. He goes, your doctor, she doesn't believe like us. He goes, you did see your mother-in-law. Now go take this. You're going to get past this and go do mm -hmm. something good. I said, okay, doc, so I'm not crazy. He goes, well, no, you find me. No, crazy. you're crazy. But <laughs> <laughs> he goes, he goes, so what else do you want to talk about? I said, well, what do you mean, doc? He says, they're paying me for an hour. He goes, I only took 20 minutes. You want to watch the Yankee game? I said, let's watch the Yankee game, doc. <laughs> you know? and, I like and, it. And he was a guy who had empathy, and he believed in me. And, mm. and my cancer doctor now, Dr. Peter Mansell, who's just a rock star in that world, he has empathy, and he believes in me. My doctors at BHS, there's no hard feelings. I never got an apology. I don't expect to get one because it's big, arrogant egos. But they didn't have any empathy. When that guy tilted mm. his hand back and went, whoa, Lou, busy summer. And, and, and I was so hurt. And it was funny because when the medics. Dude, those guys, have, some oh, of those guys were but just. Okay. Uh, but I'll never forget it. When the medics, but, <clears> I, was as red, I was as red as a tomato. And he goes, 114, what are you, are you not one of them surfer dudes down around? Oh, my away? goodness gracious. I go, Doc, I'm too fat to fly the surfboard. And when <laughs> I had paperwork and he went, whoa, this is cancer. Uh, and then the doctor <laughs> said, oh, I'm sorry. Where did you go to medical school? He said, I'm a street doctor for 25 years. This man is dying of cancer. And the medic was 100% right. I had 48 hours <laughs> to live. 
And you know what? Oh. I just want to give a shout out, Louis and the guys. John Feel. Oh. Yeah, because we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up. Yeah, John Feel is is our hero, and thank God for him because he has saved us from from a lot of stuff. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor. I'm sorry I went long. Um, no, no, no. Listen, yeah. not at all, brother. Not at all. I, I, because I've been thinking about this, and I'm gonna talk to Louis about it. We're gonna do something with uh, early detection in cancer. We're gonna do something with Rob Brown, and we're cool. gonna start hey, some brother. kind of fun. We're gonna I'm do something. Up. Sign me up. It has yeah, to. Yeah, we'll get you into. Uh, absolutely, because I know it firsthand. Mm -hmm. I was I was sick for three years when they mm -hmm. finally caught me. Yeah, and I okay. some guy died, so I'm in. Sign me up. All right, all right. we're gonna we're gonna do this. All right, um, all right, Rafi, you got any shout? -outs? I got one shout out. There was uh, unfortunately there was a uh, uh, up in Montreal. It was sent in to us by Darren. Uh, I'm just trying to see what his name was here. Uh, what is it? LaCroix, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, LaCroix, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pierre LaCroix on Monday uh, was in uh, assisting a boat in distress, and uh, I guess somehow he got trapped under the water, under the boat, and uh, he passed away, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, he had mentioned something to me, so I just looked it up. So I just wanted to give our condolences to him and uh, to his family, obviously. I got one too. I think this guy passed too early too. I believe it was cancer from two. Timothy A. Did we lose him? We lost him. He locked out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least we had a left. I, All right, I don't know what that is, Lou. <laughs> uh, Petey, take us out for now, and if he comes back on, we'll give him a shot. I'm gonna out. kick. I'm gonna kick him. Uh, yeah, I'm kick him kick out him. for now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> give okay, us well, uh, well. our plugs, and then uh, we'll All see right. what happens. Yeah, ten four. So, okay, guys. Whew, what a night. Hey guys, um, listen, if Coops yeah. if Coops doesn't come back and you need an extra co-host, I'm available. <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs> We're gonna have a chat about staying on the rails, Definitely though. Definitely a step up. Sorry about that, bro. Uh, I no, that, no, no, all good, brother. Oh, here he is. Hold on. Wow, I pulled a Frank Mole on you. <laughs> wow, we were going about to sign off. What part Coops, did you get? About to sign me. What part did I get out? Did you hear on that? We didn't hear, we didn't hear a word. Anything. We didn't hear a word. Nothing? All right, I'll do it quick again. Timothy A. Longlet of Midland Fire Department, Midland, Michigan, just retired December 5th, passed away October 15th, I believe, cancer. He was oh. our age rookie. Johnny Walters' is dad. Also, we love Johnny Pegleg. W. W's dad passed away. Uh, so our condolences go out to W. And one other thing. Uh, guys, I don't want to get too political, but a battalion chief, Steve Davis from Battalion 4 Sea Shift in Orange County Fire Rescue, just got fired for not ordering his men to take a COVID week, weekly COVID test. So maybe you want to reach out to Ron DeSantis and say, uh, yo, dude, this guy's a, a chief on the job. You know, let's get our priorities straight. That's scary. That's scary. Yep, and uh, like I said, we're going to talk about uh, something with uh, Rob Brown. Now that Hank's going, Rob, Rob's going. Yeah, he actually just texted me. He said, Told Lou <laughs> tell Louie to stop drinking. He's coming in for a blood test tomorrow. <laughs> I'm drinking water. <laughs> All right. Hey, Lou, just make sure he uses a clean glove, okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no yeah I, want to, I want to see the lube. I want to see Not a like lot of lube. Not like my homie doctor. Not like my homie doctor. Yeah, so, Nils, stay in here. Uh, I do appreciate you. Great show. Uh, I can't tell you how many guys in the chat said great, best show ever. Uh, we really appreciate it. We're going to do something. We're going to get the word out. We're going to get guys in there that get themselves checked out. You need early diagnosis. And we just thank God, Neil, that you're still, you're still here. You got one? Good. Well, we're here again. Hold on a sec. Hold on. I got to make it official. Here we go. Here we go. It's time for the old school tip of the day. 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 Go, uh, kid. Proper 12. Thank you. Oh, that's a real man. Taught me, you have to know as a fireman, everyone's job, engine chauffeur, ladder chauffeur, backup, control, door, irons, OV, roof, cam man, except for driving a fire boat, which Eddie Morrow, when I took the summer boat detail in 01, taught me how to do. You have to learn how to do it. So, guys... Even though you're assigned to the engine or you're assigned to the truck, you know everybody's job because in an emergency, you maybe have 
to be that guy to get water and get a nozzle on the fire, or you may have to be that guy to operate the aerial or the towel ladder or the tiller. So know everyone's job, because in the Army, I learned that. You had to be the radio man, the rifleman, the machine gunner, the grenade launcher. You had to know everyone's job, because when someone else went down, now it was you. So that's my tip. Enjoy every minute. It goes too fast. And guys, you're truly, truly honored and blessed to wear this badge, no matter what fire department, what police department, what medic department you work for. It's an honor to serve our citizens. Please stay safe out there. God bless you. Thank you for your service. And God bless our great country of America. Amen, brother. Pete, we forgot the uh, yeah. Pledge of Allegiance again this we, morning. We did forget, but uh, I, mean, I, I do want to say one quick thing as my shout out. And it's nothing. No, it's it's everything. It's not anything specific. It's uh, I wanted to tell the audience that no one is coming. It's up to us. OK, you're the heroes that we've all been waiting for. We are the heroes that we've been waiting for. So just keep that in mind when you vote. Keep that in mind um, when, you, when you see everything when you, in when front you of you. When you live your life, baby, do it as every an American, day. as a proud American every day. We are the heroes we've been waiting for. No one is coming. It's up to us. Amen. It's up to guys like Niels hey, Jorgensen, hey, baby. If you don't like it, GTFO, and I'll drive you to Kennedy Airport. Love it, baby. <laughs> no baby. Well, I'm now, the, uh, now, now maybe Nashville, ticket. not Nashville Airport. Yeah, well, that's right. I'll pay for the, I'll pay for the plane ticket. You don't like All it, right. GTFO. Beautiful. Guys, thank you. It's been an honor. Uh, no, no, right. Hold on, Neil. Just hang, hang loose. Don't, don't go anywhere. And if anyone could tune in, 2420podcast.com, and we're trying to get some love for Tunnel for Towers and mm. uh, and a lot of good organizations. Thanks, guys. Welcome. Here we go. Right. So, Peter, guys, Peter, get it. Last, uh, but certainly not least, here we go, guys. You guys know the deal. Find us on iTunes Podcast, Spotify, uh, or wherever fine audio podcasts are found. If you just want to listen to our show when you're at the gym, driving, so on and so forth, whatever. Guys, if you're here, youtube.com forward slash getting salty experience. Take your filthy booger hook off the bank switch and... <laughs> Hit the like, subscribe, and share button. You know how we do it here. Guys, also, head on over to Instagram if you're there. At Salty Dog Inc., Mr. Rofreno will give you the hottest fire photos in the game, plus last-minute info about the show. Getting Salty Apparel, guys. GettingSaltyApparel.com. That's how we pay the bills mostly around here. Um, head on over there for some cool stuff like this tumbler or some hats or some T-shirts. Christmas is right around the corner. If you need anything engraved, get it done now. Don't wait till the last minute because it ain't getting done. All right, guys. Super Beautiful. chats. All the guys in the super chats tonight. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you guys. Seriously, it's like, uh, and also a lot of the same people come through week after week, man. I really appreciate it. So, thank you very, very much. Uh, we're always trying to grow this show into an all-time, everyday kind of thing. I want to do this five days a week, um, six days a week, seven sometimes. All right. So, um, let's let's grow it. Get out there. Uh, like, subscribe, and share. It's massive to us to do that. That's uh, You guys are our syndicators. You guys are the ones that get us out into the world. So please continue to get, help get us syndicated. Um, also, guys, uh, Facebook, the Getting Salty Fans page. We we uh, we love the Getting Salty Fans page where you can see my face on a, on a nice jar of coconut water. <laughs> I'm not saying. I'm just saying. You know what I mean? Like you, know, Pete, you, need, to, you need to make a brand of whiskey, my brother. You got to uh, go with the whiskey. I, I love the whiskey. You know what? We'll do something. We'll do something. Get uh, Conor McGregor a run for his money. With, with uh, it won't be too hard. I heard the proper 12 is okay. I don't know. It's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good. Maybe, maybe he could be my first sponsor. Okay. I All right. Uh, we'll uh, 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 about that. All right. I like that. Uh, uh, I like salty whiskey better, bro. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, salty whiskey. That might happen. All right, here we go. All right, and guys, if you have an email uh, question for us, email us at the show at getting salty experience at gmail.com. That's for our QA show. And then for our cup of Joe and some Fuego, which you will see another episode of this week, shoot us emails at Coops Podcast shoot at gmail.com, and you will find we, uh, we need fire photos, helmet cam footage, rig photos. Tables, mustaches, yo, the, the hottest, newest one, the newest uh, one. This is my favorite shit. It's the hottest old lady contest, and we got one that wins. I'm just hey, telling you right now, hey, she. Hey, 
wins. My wife, my wife still looks pretty good, man. I might have send to it in, it. baby. Send I, it in. I don't want to be disrespectful, bro. I'll get you know, in trouble, send, that's okay. Send her in. You know what I mean? Ah, yeah, she'll, be, she'll be flattered. Yeah, there Damn you right. go. Damn right. And God, guys, thank you so much. Thanks for thanks for letting me come back to the kitchen. I really uh, I appreciate it. Ah, really we loved having you. Those great All stories, bro. Good great. stuff, man. You guys are great. Much success and much love. And, and thanks, uh, brother. God bless you. God bless you. All right. God bless you too, brother. We wish you the same. And just hang out because we'll say goodbye in the uh, yep. in the backstage. Yeah, right, we'll do. We'll do. All right, we'll see you, cool cats, on Thursday night. We got Greg Piconi, uh engine two thirty, lot one hundred thirty two, a Brooklyn guy. Uh, and tomorrow, Pete and I and Louie will be filming a couple episodes of the old Cup of Joe and Fuego. All right, fellas. We'll see you, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you at the next one. Stay low and go. All right, everybody. We'll see you at the big one. Have a good night. Cheers, brothers and sisters. Cheers. <laughs>